The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays or Sundays, SOR Media, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the expressed written consent of SOR Media is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Are you experienced? Then come own the night with us. Brother has taken control, shoveling dirt in every hole. Predators to condemn your soul, watching you and watching me. We're all Station atop the mountains of British Columbia, live from SOR headquarters. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. Like nothing's wrong Soon you will be long You can follow us on our website spacedoutradio.com and on Spaced Out Radio on iTunes You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Dave Scott S-O-R on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Brother wants to make headlines, be immortalized. Everyone's got an electric guy with the digital spies. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. I know you're out there. It's Tuesday, July 10th, Wednesday, July 11th, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond. And this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a great day and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, broadcasting to you live from the Great White North on top of the mountains of central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We are 150,000 strong nightly on the SOR radio network and deep talk radio. We say thank you for all of you tuning in. You can also listen to our archives. They are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. I just need the favor from you. Do me a favor, please. Hit that subscribe button. I would appreciate that. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we got a plethora of features for you. Rock out to some Bumblefoot shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. Read up on the encounter online and so much more. We're heading into the weird and the wild tonight. If you've seen Monsters, this is the show you want to listen to because we are getting into it. Our guest is... He's one of the best of the East Coast when it comes to searching for creatures that could tear you apart limb from limb. It's going to be very, very good. Since we were all kids, we've been told about monsters, monsters under our bed or in our closets, monsters in the forests. Funny, our parents were so much involved in this to the point that some of us were traumatized with the fear about heading out into the wilderness, or even sleeping with a closet door open at night. Come on, show of hands. I know I can't see them, but a show of hands out there. Who here cannot sleep with the closet door open or your feet outside the covers? 
Monsters, man, you gotta love them. Tonight we are focusing on Monsters with David Spinks, who has a new book coming out from David Weatherly's publishing company. David grew up in the Flatwoods area of West Virginia. He has also an amazing encounter with Sasquatch that he's going to share with us for the first time. And finding out what these monsters are is a passion for the former U.S. Air Force veteran who was based in Arizona when the Phoenix Lights appeared in 1997. Yes, the strain sure follows the Sphinxian one. And in hour number three, Everett Themer will be back with strange news on the encounter. Always good to have David Spinks back on. Man, the last time we had you on, we were talking about the Phoenix Lights, and now we're talking Bigfoot, Flatwoods Monster, Dogman, Mothman, any creature that ends in man. How come they never end in woman? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Always good to have you on the show, David. How have you been? I'm good, man. How are you? Thanks for having me on tonight. Not a problem, man. It's uh, It's been always uh, good times, and, you know, we got David Weatherly who comes on every second month, so we're always talking about you and Ross Allison on this show and the incredible investigations that you do. My friend, I would like you to do me a favor because, you know, yeah. for, our, for our audience here, we always like to make sure that they know who you are because for a lot of people who may be tuning in for the first time, they may not know about your history and how you got involved in searching for these strange cryptids and paranormal. Well, yeah. Um, well, back, what, what started it all for me really was uh, an experience I had with my late grandfather. Um, you know, spending the summers away from my family or spending time away from my family. Cause my stepdad was in the air force. When I lived on Kirtland air force base, I would always come back home to West Virginia to spend time with my family, uh, both sets of grandparents and my dad and everybody. So long story short on that, you know, one summer back in 1983, I had a planned a fishing trip with my, my dad's dad, Oscar Spinks. And we were, set to go to one of our favorite places here in West Virginia known as the Gauley River. Um, it's a place we had frequent in, you know, pretty much my whole life as a, as a kid. We would go there and fish and camp out for the weekend. Well, this particular summer, it was 1983, like I said, I was 13 years old. And I was super excited to come, you know, come home and visit my grandparents and, and go spend time uh, fishing with my grandpa. So, I was dropped off by my mom to my grandfather's house with my gear and we loaded up and headed out to the river. And, you know, I couldn't hardly, I couldn't hardly wait. You know, I had that young boy excitement, wanted to catch some fish, you know, and I, I'm sure I was uh, wearing all my grandfather's patience because I was so excited. So as soon as we got there, <clears throat> you know, we started unpacking our gear and I kept asking him, you know, uh, if I could go ahead and cast. And finally, after several times of asking, he gave in and said, go ahead. So I, I cast it, you know, cast it in and he was still getting the gear together. And lo and behold, I caught a really nice trout, you know, and it was, it was a nice one, you know, one is the biggest trout I ever had caught in up until that time. And I was fighting it, you know, and he came over and he was helping me and everything. And, and I was super stoked and, you know, we got it in, he got the net and helped me get it in. And so we just kept on fishing and in no time, you know, he started fishing as well cause he got excited. And in no time we both had caught our limit in West Virginia and it's, it's six fish, you know, it's not that many. You're allowed to catch six per day per person. So after we caught our fish, um, hold on a second. Started, here. You're, you're allowed six. Damn it, man. Up yeah. here up here it's limit two to four. Oh yeah. <laughs> Holy cow, I'm getting ripped off up here. <laughs> ah, sorry about your luck, Dave. <laughs> um so getting, you know, into the story, we finished setting up our camp, uh, got a fire going and ate like champs, you know. We had brought along uh cornbread and everything from grandma and you know, we fried up fried potatoes right there on the fire and the fish and ate like champs. Well, 
we're sitting there relaxing and it's getting closer to dark now, probably within a half an hour or so of dark. And, uh, out of nowhere, this huge splash happens out in the river. We didn't see what caused it, you know, but it was loud enough to where there was such a big splash that the water rained down from it, you know, and it was that real deep cut boom sound when something really big hits the water and then the water rains down. So we jump up and we're looking around and the river, the, the part of the river we were at was uh, about 75 yards across. It's not a small river. It's a good sized river. It's run, it runs pretty fast. And on the other side of that bank, it's very, very steep. I mean, it's, there's not even areas that people go on that side of the bank because it's so steep and so rugged, you know, there's no reason for people to really be over there. So we're looking around, didn't see anything. Well, we figured, you know, maybe a large branch out of a tree fell and, but we didn't see anything floating in the water. And then we figured, well, maybe a rock rolled off of the bank over there and went in the water. But I saw the splash you know, coming down after it hit and it was kind of more towards the middle of the river where there was nothing really that could have caused that. So after several minutes, we kind of sat back down and got relaxed again and it wasn't no time at all. I heard something coming up through the trees and I saw this huge boulder coming in an upward direction, uh, through the tree limbs, making the noise of something crashing through the tree limbs and then it came down and landed in the river well that scared the living hell out of me you know and i didn't see what caused it but i knew something wasn't right because there's a boulder that a a grown man couldn't even probably get his arms around you know coming up through the trees now i could see if one rolled off the bank it would be coming down in a downward angle this thing came up through the trees and hit the water so we jumped up we're looking around and I'm, I'm freaking out and we just kind of froze, you know, and I looked at my grandpa and he had like these deer in the headlights look and this, you're talking about a guy here who stormed the beaches at Normandy. This guy wasn't afraid of nothing. And to see his face really scared me because he knew something wasn't right either. And out of, within a few seconds after the splash hit, this, Blood curdling, guttural scream, howl, whatever you want to call it, came from that side of the river. And I'm telling you, you could feel it in your lungs, you know. And we were like, oh my God. So I turned around and my grandpa, he's running for the tent. And I'm like, oh my God, what's he doing? And I'm, I'm realizing, oh, I know what he's doing. He's going to grab the gun. So as he comes back from the tent, he comes back with his shotgun, old single shot 12 gauge, you know. He yells at me to get to the truck, boy. So I run over to the truck and I'm cowering down and, you know, kind of on the front quarter panel, kind of peeking around toward that direction. And he yells across the river, you hoodlum, stop screwing around or I'm going to shoot. So in his mind, he's thinking there's people over there doing something, you know. Well, right as he got done yelling that, another one of those blood curdling screams occurs. And I, I can see the trees over there. You're talking 30 to 40, 60 foot trees, not huge around, but really tall, you know, and they start shaking and then this God awful racket with this hollering and stuff starts happening. So my grandpa lets off a shot over there in that direction, you know, shotgun is not going to do much damage at that distance. And then you hear another scream. And that's when I see that thing and it, it starts walking at a 45 degree angle up the side of the mountain. And as it's walking, it's screaming, making one hell of a racket and the trees are shaking and everything. And he lets off two or three shots. And then he comes running at me and grabs me with one arm and throws me into the passenger seat of the truck said, we're getting out of here, son. That's not of God. And he peels out of there. The trucks, you know, we're on a dirt road, mind you, that's really rough. And he, I thought we were going to die because the, for one, the truck's going to fall apart before we make it up out of here. Cause it's a good four miles up to the hard top from there. And he's bouncing bottom and out the truck. And I got my head buried in my, you know, in my hands thinking we're going to die. This thing is going to come and get us. And we finally make it up out of there. He drives around for a little while and he pulls over and he says, son, we better not talk about this because people are going to think we're crazy, you know, and 
mind you, my grandfather was a preacher at that time. After the war, he was a We're going to get Dave back right now. His cell phone seemed to have cracked out there. I wonder how many rings it'll take. We got you now. We got you now. It's amazing. Amazing. Sometimes you start talking Sasquatch, and all of a sudden the tinfoil has to come out. Yeah, the gremlins in the machine, man. Yeah, that's the gremlins. So, uh, Go ahead. So he pulls up. He pulls over, and you know we're talking about this. He's a you know he's a preacher, and he says we can't tell anyone of it about this. They're going to think I'm crazy. They're going to think I'm doing drugs. You know, and I can't have my parishioners singing like this. So we made a promise right then and there that we'd never talk about it. Well. My grandfather died a couple of years ago, and I decided I was going to talk about it, and I wrote about it in uh, David Weatherly's Woodknock series, Volume 2. And I was before I did anything, you know, I talked to my uncle because I wanted him to know I was going to talk about this story, um, that, you know, this experience me and grand, Grandpa had. And he started laughing, and he said, oh, you're talking about that monkey man you and Papa saw way back when. And I said, what? He told you? And he said, yeah. He goes, he came to me like 20 years ago and said, I got to tell somebody this in case something happens to me. I want I want you to know what happened, what me and David saw in the, in the woods that day. And <laughs> so here I kept the secret all these years, and then my, you know, he had told my uncle about it. <laughs> so, you know, it is what it is, but... Um, yeah, it, it messed me up for quite a long time, um, you know, and that was like my first introduction into into that whole aspect of things, realizing, hey, there is monsters out there, and there is, I don't know what it was. I know it was a large bipedal ape-looking hominid, you know, hominid creature that was huge, that was wide as two men put together. And it was tearing down trees, and it was it could yell like anything that I've never heard in my life. And I never went back in the woods for several years after that. And you're talking about a guy here who grew up in the woods hunting and fishing his whole life. And, you know, as I got older, I, I wanted to know what the hell it was. And I started discovering that, hey, other people had seen similar type things like this. And I, that's when I kind of learned about the Patterson-Gimlin film and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't feel so alone then, you know. but. Uh, I know what I saw was real, what it was for sure. I don't know, you know, and, uh, I can't say that I know for sure. You know, only thing I can describe it as is what the native Americans call Sasquatch or what we call Bigfoot. And, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty intense, you know, when you have an experience like that, when you can feel this thing that's 75 yards away, when it roars, you can feel it in your insides, you know, and, yeah. uh, it, it was a spooky, spooky thing, and I still don't go into the woods to this day without a freaking large caliber firearm on my side, man. Hey, um, Dave, I want to ask you here, because you, you got a couple of points that I don't want to forget about here. Number one, you said yeah. you you would never mention this story, and you and your grandpa made a, a pact on that. Why are you talking about it now? Well, because I think it's important. Um, uh, in, in some aspects, and I and I want to share. You know, people know what I do now anyway, and I people often ask me, you know, what what got you started in this, and that's what it is. So that's why I share it. You know, it, it's important to have that personal experience. I think to help build credibility with people who have had that experience themselves, but maybe a little bit too shy uh, to make things go. You know. Boy, we're having a bad cell phone connection with him. We're, we're going to have to try and improve this. Def Forwarded. Hmm. Give me one second here, guys. We're trying to get him, him back here. Obviously, oh, there we go. Hey, Dave, I'm just wondering, do you have another number that we can try you at if your cell phone's going to keep cutting out there? Uh, well, I don't know what's going on, man. I got max bars, so something weird. Sasquatch doesn't want you talking about him. 
I don't know. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll trudge forward, my friend. We will trudge forward. Yeah. And you know, like I got a couple people ask, can you connect up with them with Skype? Dave lives in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia, and the internet there is more spotty than the cell phone. So we got to try and battle it this way a little bit. So that's what we are going to do. I just want to let our audience know that because Dave and I had that conversation pre-show. So right beforehand, we were we were just talking, Dave, how important it is for you to share that experience as a researcher into this because number one when you're dealing with people who have had an experience they cannot understand it really helps them relax as well when you can sit back and tell them that story as well right oh absolutely um it helps people relax and you'd be surprised after folks hear me tell my story they come forward with their own encounter or their own experiences and that's what it's all about that's the only way in my mind that we're going to further the field um, in, in some aspects, you know, by people sharing and reaching out, sharing their stories and their experiences. That's what it's all about. And hopefully, you know, in a combined manner with these things coming out, we can uh, trudge forward and maybe make some progress into finding out more answers as to what these things are, why they're here and all that. The other point that I wanted to get to was about the experience I know I'm going on a Bigfoot search tomorrow in the mountains here, and I just got a report from a logging company about some prints that they have found in their area where they are getting ready to, you know, uh, cut down some trees, and it's freaked them out a little bit. So we're actually going out trying to get out to that area tomorrow. But when it comes to people not wanting to say anything because people will think you're crazy or people will think that, you know, you're a little bit loony or whatever it is, there is a real stigma about that. People are afraid of talking about something that they saw that they cannot explain. Absolutely. I mean, that's normal, normal human response. You know, people are scared of the unknown. The unknown is a powerful, powerful thing. And when someone can't understand what they've witnessed or what they've experienced, you know, it's very frightening to them. So they chalk it up as, oh, it was just that this or it was that, you know, oh, it was, you know, it was a shadow play or light, you know. You didn't really see that. You was, you know, you saw a bear. Well, let me tell you something. I, I knew, I know what I saw was not a damn bear. I've been around bears my whole life. I have one. We have them that come in our yard here where we live now. I know what a bear is, and what I saw was not a bear. And you know, there is some stigma, like you said, with that. You know, people are going to ridicule you. They're going to, you know, not believe you. But it's up to you uh, if you tell your story or not. And but like I said, I, I felt compelled to do it because of those type of situations. And that's why I do what I do, you know, and I pursued like, you know, when I was researching what the hell I saw and trying, and I didn't have the luxury of the internet back in those days. It was through magazine articles, newspapers and whatnot. Um, you just have to decide if you want to put yourself out there in that aspect or not. And a lot of people here in West Virginia have had, there's thousands and thousands of reports, you know, but people don't talk to outsiders here very often. Um, and they're very reluctant to talk to insiders on stuff like this because, and especially in the Bible Belt areas, you know, when it comes to anything paranormal, you know, they're, they'll just chalk it up as, well, you're messing with demons and whatnot, and you'll be ridiculed in that manner as well. Well, I mean, that also goes to show that there is still an old school thinking. I mean, yes, there are a lot of people who would love to hear that story. All right. I mean, the people who listen to this type of show are into that type of story. But there are a lot of people out there who want no part of it. They don't want any part of of something that they can't explain because they either think with their five senses or it scares them so bad that it's just easier to just shut up about it rather than bring it out to the open. Absolutely. And you're right. A hundred percent. I mean, it's again, it's the unknown. People are scared to death of something they don't understand or they're not, it's not, it's out of the norm. You know, it's not the normal way of uh, people's everyday, their safety net, you know, their nine to five job, their house, you know, 
that, that's all they worry about. People got their head buried in their cell phones. They never look up anymore. They never observe their surroundings. And let me tell you, you know, firsthand knowledge here, there's all kinds of stuff going on around you that you don't understand and don't really realize what's happening. I mean, if you just take the time and go out in the woods and spend some time and watch the sky and, you know, you'll see all kinds of things that will blow your mind. And, and I can guarantee that if you go out two, three times a week for a month, you're going to see something in the sky or something in the woods that's going to really trip you out. You know, it's one of those things where I know up here, a lot of the logging companies and even the mining companies and people who have had experiences up here, they know or they have been told to keep quiet about it, not to address any attention to it whatsoever. Now, the fear from the logging companies is, well, hell, if Bigfoot gets noticed and can be can be proven as a real creature, that's really going to screw up the entire forest industry up here. And that's the truth oh, of it. Yeah. That's the truth yeah, of it, Yeah, it Dave. is. As you're right, 100%. That's a whole other aspect that's not often talked about. Um, I'm sure you've heard the stories uh, of when Mount St. Helens blew up. There was reports from people said that government helicopters were carrying bodies of uh, Sasquatch out of those woods after St. Saint- Mount yes. St. Helens blew up. I mean, there's there's some really intriguing stories about the government cover-ups going on with Bigfoot, and, you know, that's a whole nother area, you know, a whole nother show. But, I mean, if you really look into this stuff and research some of the reports, they're quite amazing, um, some of the reports. Um, you've got numerous military uh, units that have said during training exercises all throughout the United States and around the world they were paralleled by groups of Bigfoot at night in the woods. I mean, that's, I mean, how compelling of a story is that? Why would these military guys make up something like that? They wouldn't. No, and I agree. And I know up here, though, because logging is still a major export industry, a multi-billion dollar industry to British Columbia's economy, that to have any sort of creature, new creature, that could be found up here. And and I would assume it's the exact same issue in Washington State, in Oregon, in the northern part of California, or anywhere where there's logging as an industry. That the minute you, that the minute you you find a new creature, they're going to shut you down because they are not going to be able to keep logging if if you're uh, causing some sort of destructive habitat on maybe an endangered species. And that's oh, the, the fear. Same, same here, Dave. I mean, West Virginia, the second largest in, uh, industry in West Virginia is logging. It's, you know, there's places here in West Virginia that are so rugged and remote that people have either never stepped foot in it or haven't done so in hundreds of years, you know, uh, and, you know, it's the same thing here. And who knows, you know, there's, I've got hundreds and hundreds of sightings reported to me by native West Virginians and other folks traveling through West Virginia. And that's just me. I'm only one reporting site. You know, that's not counting all the other reporting sites and then all the other folks that have never reported what they actually saw either on any kind of, to any person or investigator or on a site. So, you know, it's pretty compelling stuff, and it makes total sense that that would be a total cover-up. Well, when it involves money and it involves industry, that's a, that's a big thing. But I do know that there are a lot of logging people in our area who have had experiences, and they just keep quiet about it. You know, and oh, yeah. a, a good friend of mine up here, he actually ran into a conservation officer one day when he was actually searching for Sasquatch tracks. And the conservation officer asked him what he was doing, and he thought he was going to get laughed at and says, would you believe that I'm actually looking for Bigfoot tracks? And this led to about a 30-minute conversation. Keeping it long story short, the conservation officer literally told him, we have seen things out here that we are not allowed to talk about. Basically mm-hmm. saying that if they do talk about it, his 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 ass is grass, and he is literally looking for a brand new career. Absolutely, uh, I got a good story in my new book that's coming out, West Virginia Bigfoot, from a forester, a state forester here in West Virginia, 
same type of scenario you just talked about. And he, he, uh, is only a short time away from retiring. So he put, he wanted me to share his story in the book. So it's in the book too, you know, so you have some people coming forward with these types of things that that's great. You know, could you give us a little taste of that one? Oh, he just told me several instances. Uh, you know, he's out in the remote areas of West Virginia, and he has come across uh, several different trackways. And on several occasions, one occasion, early in the morning, he um, the, it was real foggy out there on the mountain where he was at, and he saw something come out of the tree line that looked like a person, but he was a good, you know, couple hundred yards off from him, and when he, he kind of got out of his truck and yelled at the, you know, thinking it was a guy or whatever. And the thing just turned and like kind of loped off back into the same trees that he came out of. So he went over there to see what was going on. And he found a huge trackway with 18 inch tracks, you know, leading back to where it came out, turned around and went back through the woods. And he said he could smell a really uh, foul stench and everything when he got over there. So, you know, the typical foul stench smell that's reported by folks that have had encounters with Sasquatch and Bigfoot. Question about the the stench and the aggressiveness because of the rock throwing that you witnessed. And I know in British Columbia here, we have a beautiful fishing area in the Harrison area where there is plenty of Sasquatch sightings every single year. And if you're in the field of Sasquatch and don't know about the, you know, the Harrison Hot Springs area for Sasquatch, well, you're in the dark of the entire subject. Doesn't matter where you are in North America. But nonetheless, there right off the Harrison River, there's a, a river called the Chehalis River, and there's a, there's a beautiful coho hole uh, right along uh, the banks, and it leads into this area where where there's probably about a hundred and fifty foot rock wall in on the one side, and you got to hike your way into this. But I mean, it's the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful places to actually catch fish. And there was a group of fishermen in there fishing for coho in the mid 2000s that are actually had boulders boulders not little rocks dropped in on them but major like 100 200 300 pound boulders thrown off Mm -hmm. that embankment not rolled off because you can tell the difference they actually got so scared they stopped fishing and were watching these boulders get thrown over the edge at them sounds familiar (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? So I guess what I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, when it comes to the aggressiveness of this creature, do you think that goes to the individual creature, or do you think that goes to the idea that maybe you're in a, 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 a sensitive habitat, maybe there's Sasquatch children around, or do you think that this creature is pretty much docile, except for maybe a few who? just don't like men much like some dogs don't like people i think it could be a little of both you know the native americans talk about uh that these things are very territorial you know and they mark their you know supposedly they mark their areas with trees that are uprooted and stuck in the ground upside down or trees that are crossed i think i think it might be a territorial type thing or it could be like you said uh maybe there's some uh young young ones around and they're being protected who knows any you know numerous animal species are known to to act in an aggressive manner in those type of scenarios you know so oh you know that's you know purely speculation as to why but i mean those are pretty good substantial reasons why something would act in that manner i think yet we have really no record of this creature killing anybody not that I've ever heard, no. But I know there's been people attacked. Uh, you know, there's numerous reports of people having rocks thrown at them, uh, tr- pieces of tree branch or, or whatever, or uh, rushed at, you know, uh, in an aggressive manner. Um, and there's even a couple of stories where people said that uh, way, real way back stories where one guy claimed to have been abducted by Bigfoot. And when he came uh, came to, he was there with a a small family group of them and he ended up giving one of them giving the 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 big male the uh some tobacco and when it when it you know it kind of overtook him and he 
became, you know, began to choke and cough and like get sick from it. He, that's when he made his escape <laughs> from him. And that's an old famous story, you know? So yeah, that's but, here, uh, here in British Columbia. Uh, yeah. Albert, Albert Oth- Ostman was the name. Yeah. Yep. And that was a, yeah, that's a fascinating story too. Yeah, whether it's real or not, who knows? But uh, it sure is a great story either way. It is. It is absolutely crazy. So, for our listeners who have never heard that story, do you mind filling them in on that? Well, just like we said, you know, the guy was—I uh, think he was trapping or hunting one of the two. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember. I read that story years ago. Uh, he was basically taken kidnapped by a, a large uh, male Bigfoot. He was, he was knocked unconscious. Was he sleeping in his sleeping bag? I can't remember. But Yeah, he was he, he was in his sleeping yeah, bag. Yeah, he was taken in the night and knocked unconscious or something. And he woke up, he came to, and he was around this family of Bigfoots. You know, there was a little, a young one or two, and a, and a, and a female, and this big one. And he sat around the sat around with them for quite some time, not knowing what to do. So it popped into his mind that he would pull out some tobacco and offer it to the big one. And the big one, you know, he put some in his mouth, and then he gave it to the big one, and the big one put some in his mouth, and then became really, really violently ill from it. And that's when he made his escape. That's what I remember of that story. I mean, that was years ago when I read that. Yeah, and we're talking that story goes back to around 1926, yeah, so, somewhere 100. around there. Like, we're coming around on 100. 100. Yeah, and that area, I mean, it is still uninhabited, uninhabited in that area. It's just absolutely amazing. So what do you think Bigfoot actually is then? There's many in the research and scientific community who think that it may be part of Gigantopithecus, that it may be part of some unknown North American ape that stayed when Pangaea broke apart. Or you go with the First Nations who believe it's Mm -hmm. a shapeshifter or an interdimensional being. Right, yeah. I mean, you could go either way with it because, you know, until, you know, you got us always go back to there's never been a, a live specimen captured and studied that we know of. Of course, who knows what the government has. But, you know, for me, I know what I saw was a living and breathing creature. I don't know, like I said earlier, I don't know what it, you know, if it was some kind of interdimensional creature. You know, there's many theories out there. It's an alien. It's an interdimensional being. It's uh, some type of, uh, lot, you know, forest protector. Uh, according to some Native American cultures, um, or a shapeshifter. I mean, it, there's so many different theories because no one, it's all pure speculation because there's, up until this point, there's never been uh, a, an alive one captured or a dead one, you know, captured. So it's just really speculation. But does that not enhance the the thought that maybe First Nations people may be onto something that we have never found a body or captured a creature or even come close to proving is its existence. I mean, let's face it. There really hasn't been a very good video of this creature in the last 50 years since the Patterson Gimlin film. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. And, um, you know, if it, you know, there's many, re- there's several reports that I've read over the years out there that talk, uh, of someone seeing a, a creature like this, uh, and they are trailing this creature. Uh, they're following the trackway. They come upon the creature. The creature goes around a tree and then disappears into thin air. There's no trackway left. There's no creature. So, you know, what is this thing? Does it have some kind of capabilities we don't know about? You know, is it, does it have alien technology? Is it, is it interdimensional? Uh, who knows? I mean, there's all kinds of different stories out there, and it's fascinating to me. But that opens up a, a, another can of worms here when it comes to looking at this creature because there are so many people out there who are absolutely against this creature being looked at in any type of way other than, I'm going to use the word scientific. But my theory of science, breaking it down to the simplistic form, is, of course, it's to prove or disprove theory. Yet a lot of these researchers, Dave, 
are closing the door on a lot of these theories because they don't believe in it personally. So uh, how do you think that is investigating any type of future investigation when it comes to Sasquatch if we're closing doors because we refuse to even look at the ideas of Uh interdimensional or shape-shifting? Well, it goes, you know, it goes right back to, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, uh, they discovered the, the mountain gorillas is what 50 years ago. Uh, last year they discovered a whole new species of orangutan. Um, and that was never known of before. They just recently, um, you know, like I said, they found the, uh, giant squid. It was all hearsay and filled in. So, you know, these scientists that, you know, that are closing the doors on things that, there's no special live or dead specimens. That's just doing the whole community. And even the world of scientific community, uh, uh, it's a travesty, really, because it's doing, that's what it's all about. It's about discovery, and it's about proving theories, as you said. I mean, if you approach science with a closed mind, you're doing everyone a disservice, in my opinion, you know, because... They're discovering new species almost daily on this planet in the oceans. The oceans are only like 20% of that, uh, you know, explored. So what's to say there's not some kind of giant ape that that goes undiscovered? I think, you know, if it is a giant ape, it's it's small in numbers and, it you know, they're nomadic in nature and they constantly move to where the food is. And personally, you know, that would be uh, an educated guess on my part, you know, but... Uh, it is what it is, and I just wish some more of these scientific-minded people um, would open their minds a little bit more and realize that it, it is a definite possibility that there is a, a living, breathing creature, large, hominid ape walking the earth, you know? Why do you think the scientific community has been so slow or against picking up this topic on whether it or not it truly exists? Well, there's several, you know, over the years, there's been several people's minds that have been changed, and there's some some pretty uh, educated scientific people out there, like Jeff Meldrum and others that are, you know, you're talking PhD folks and, and stuff like that that are really taking a hard look at this because, you know, they've, they've studied the uh, striations and the you know, footprints and everything else and said, Hey, this is the real deal. This, this is not uh, made up. This is some type of unknown creature. We don't have a specimen to study yet. So, you know, there's, there's some, there's, there's some on this side of the fence and some on the other side of the fence, you know, and hopefully one day that discovery will be made to say, Hey, yeah, you know, those people, they were seeing a real living and breeding creature, uh, large ape, you know, so, you know, you just got to wait and see. Only time will tell, I guess. A lot of people feel, a lot of people feel though, Dave, that the only way this is going to be proven is with a body. And you would think ever since the Patterson Gimlin film with how many people are looking for this creature, you know, because they think of the fame and the potential fortune that may come along with it. You have to think that there would have been something found. Now, the obvious excuse is, how often have you seen a bear carcass or a wolf carcass or a deer carcass around? And and that is true. That is very That's true. Absolutely, absolutely true. I, like I said, I've been hunting and fishing in the woods all around this country my whole life, primarily in West Virginia. I've never, ever come across a bear carcass ever in the woods, ever. And I've seen plenty of bear, but never found a carcass ever. Um, and, the, and the simple fact of that matter is when anything dies in the woods, it is consumed almost immediately by every little creature from insects all the way up to carnivores uh, within days. The bone is even eaten by chipmunks and bugs and everything because they recycle the calcium in the bones, you know. So you stuff is, you know, disappears quick in the wilderness, let me tell you. Well, I mean, it's like the old ashes to ashes, dust to dust from the Bible. You know what I'm saying? 
I mean, Absolutely. That, I mean, that's a reality of it. I mean, nature is going to uh, giveth and they're going to take it away as well. And you can't really blame them for that. But do you think it's a, a very naive cause then to say that it's a body that we need in order to, you know, prove the existence? I mean, because I realize you can't go a lot on footprints. But when you, right. but it would, you know, like when it, if we compare it to crop circles and the hoaxers who are doing these crop circles in North America, in England, I mean, you would literally have to have at least a couple hundred to a couple thousand people in on this conspiracy around North America planting prints in the middle of nowhere. Of whether, whether it's your state or your or your province, you'd have to have a ton of people in on this conspiracy, dropping prints in the middle of a logging road, you know, 75 miles from any town where there's not even any vehicles spotted. Right, and for the fact of that matter, if you're going to go through all that trouble of placing these fake footprints, you don't even know if anyone's going to find them. So why even waste your time to go out in the middle of nowhere and do this? You know, so, yeah, you got to take a hard look at those, you know, types of situations and say, hey, and, and, and use your brain a little bit and say, why would anyone go through all that trouble and not even, you know, especially up where in the area where you live? I mean, you're talking vast expanses of wilderness where nobody ever goes very, very rarely, you know, um, so, and it's the same in different areas of the state too. You know, there's vast expanses of wilderness that people are very unlikely to come across anything like that, you know, and for someone to go out in the middle, like you said, out in the middle of nowhere and hoax a, a trackway, I mean, and in the hopes of someone finding it doesn't make any, it doesn't make sense basically. And that's what kind of bugs me about it is because you would need all of those hoaxers. So why don't we give more credence to these weird and strange footprints that are being found? I mean, like I look at the search site that I am going to tomorrow. All right, there, there's maybe in that area 100 people, if that. Yeah. All yeah. right. And I'm dri- we'll be driving probably about 75 to 90 minutes to get there. And literally, the majority of that will be on a gravel road. So, I mean, you just have to, you know, shake your head sometimes when you when you think of some of these conclusions. Absolutely. And then another aspect, too, you have to look at is how many people, you know, uh, according to, you know, a lot of theories and stuff, these creatures are primarily nocturnal. Now, how many people do you know that are out trouncing around the wilderness in the middle of the night? And obviously these things are intelligent in some aspect because, you know, they're very well, they just, you know, they hide well, they're not, they don't come out into public areas very often, not many reports of them in, you know, areas where there's homes and whatnot. So, you know, it goes back to, you know, you know, folks saying, well, how come they're not seen more often? And well, to me, that's a primary reason because number one, they're nocturnal for the most part. And number two, they're in areas that are not inhabited by a lot of people, you know, rural, very rural areas. And you'll have more sightings in those rural areas just for that simple fact, you know? So, you know, you got to take all of that. When you take a whole ball of wax, the whole big picture of all these thousands of reports, there's just no way that those, re- all those reports are falsified and hoax. There's just no way. And, you know, I know what I saw, so I'm, you know, you know what side of the fence I'm on with it, but until you actually have an experience like that, of course you're going to have the naysayers and all of that because it goes back to the unknown topic we talked about, the fear of the unknown, and people just don't want to be open-minded and realize, hey, there's stuff out there, there's freaking stuff out there we just don't understand, and there's stuff that, that there's monsters out there, basically, you know? Things out there that could kill you, kill a human, and break them like a toothpick with no problem at all. 
We got about six minutes here before we have to go to our first break of the night, and I want to just continue on dog. I mean, on Bigfoot here because we're going to switch gears and go into Flatwoods Monster because you grew up in the Flatwoods area and you're very familiar with that story. But when it comes to Bigfoot, then and you're not sure really what we are dealing with in the forest. Is there going to come a time where we'll have the proper technology or the proper ability to actually prove this existence, Dave? Or do you think that, you know, to put your tinfoil hat on for a second, that there may be some sort of conspiracy out there as to why this creature remains so elusive? Or maybe it's something else. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I think with the... Uh, with the advancing technology we have nowadays with the new thermal cameras becoming uh, more readily available and affordable for the average uh, investigator, you know, you don't have to be a freaking millionaire to purchase one of these things now. And with the new drone technology, you know, now they have drones that you can mount a FLIR camera on. And I think with the advances in technology, I think in the near future, we, we should be getting more solid video proof of these creatures more, you know, just a lot better technology, and I think there's a good chance that we will start seeing uh, better video and better picture uh, proof of these things, of these type of animals running around or creatures, whatever they may be, uh, in the wilderness areas. Because as that this technology advances, you know, people are going to utilize it. And if you can, if you can view things from the air, you can see a lot farther than on the ground, especially in the woods. Um, you know, you can see for miles with my drones. I mean, I can fly here a thousand feet in the air and see five miles, you know, now if I mount a thermal camera on that drone, I'm going to be able to see good thermal shapes of animals in the woods. I've done it before already and I've utilized that technology. So hopefully one of these days, one of us will capture some really good footage of one of these creatures in the woods, whether it be with a thermal or just with uh the high resolution cameras now that are available on these small drones. Is that going to be enough evidence though, to satiate the appetite of the skeptics out there who say, look, you're, (laughs) you're searching for nothing. Well, you know, there's always going to be naysayers. You could, it's, it's with anything in the, in the paranormal slash supernatural realm. You could have a ghost sit down next to you and have a conversation with it. And people would not, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't believe you. Even if you had it on video, well, you hoax that. I mean, there's always going to be naysayers. You know, you. one thing I always talk about is uh, you can't change people's minds and politics and religion and, and beliefs of those sorts, so why even try? You know, just put out there what you got and let people make up their own mind. I get that, and I can appreciate that. But, you know, technology over the last 10 years especially has grown phenomenally where, you know, I mean, we always worried about blurriness or pixelation on cameras. And then with the advent of of great cameras like GoPro and, and other companies upping their game, we have seen some amazing photos of clarity more so than we've ever seen in mankind's history yet when it comes to sasquatch dog man or whatever else is strange and weird it's always blurry and then we get the term blob squatch so why is it then that even with the advancements of today's technology do you think that we still can't get a clear video or a clear photo i don't know maybe it goes to the point that this creature is some sort of interdimensional being that has some kind of uh, EMF attached to it or something that messes with the camera's electronics. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. That's a great point. There is all, always a lot of blurry pictures that seem to come up in these instances with these creatures. So, you know, I don't know. You know, that's one of the questions that we're, you know, searching for answers to. Mm -hmm. But you even can expand on that. I mean, people throwing multiple trail cams in areas they feel are Sasquatch hotspots, you pick up every other creature clearly, and then when Sasquatch comes around or allegedly comes around, all of a sudden there's missing frames, batteries go dead, or there's Mm -hmm. these weird white orbs that seem to be around. I mean, it's it's just phenomenal that... 
the coincidence of that happening, David, are... I don't even know how to put it. I really don't know how to put it. It just seems way too coincidental. Well, me and Weatherly always talk about that. You know, there's to us, there's no such thing as that much coincidence. So, you know, apparently there's some kind of uh, interference uh, that it's affecting maybe some of these electronics when these creatures are, are around. I don't know, but, you know, it's awful strange how it happens time and time again, you know, when, when these types of uh, pictures and videos are put forth by folks that uh, allegedly had, you know, captured something of unknown origin on, on the cameras itself. So, you know, what is that? Uh, who knows? But we're trying to find, you know, we're all searching for the same thing. So hopefully we'll figure it out. <laughs> is that a topic right there that maybe we in the Sasquatch community should be taking more seriously is the fact that, this creature is always blurry or when it comes to trail cams just seems to be able to almost like, I hate to use this term, but flick a switch and disappear. Yeah. It's, it's very strange, you know, and, um, what if maybe, you know, we can, uh, come up with some different, uh, thinking out of the box a little bit, you know, maybe, uh, attaching, uh, some type of meters that can pick up different EMF fields and whatnot that when one of these videos or pictures are captured that somehow record the EMF or the, you know, radiant possible radiation or whatever these creatures may be putting off at the time of their appearance, you know, so we can measure that in a scientific manner to see, Hey, yeah, this could cause, this could cause these cameras to malfunction or not focus properly or something of that sort. You know, there's gotta be different ways we can try to measure different uh, emf fields and whatnot in that aspect Mm -hmm. david i'm going to get you to hold on we're going to step out for our first break of the night david spinks is our guest tonight on spaced out radio he is a paranormal slash cryptid researcher out of west virginia one of the best he's got a book coming out next month or in the next week or so through david weatherly's production and publishing crew and we're going to be getting into the flatwoods monster right after the break. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back right after this. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Coming September 28th to the 30th, it's our first annual Caribou Paracon, put on by Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers. Three days of paranormal, supernatural, and spiritual knowledge in the beautiful 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Tickets are $150 Canadian for the event, being held at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Come watch our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Lorian Fenton, David Weatherly, Ross Allison, and more. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with the Four Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Hi there, this is Tess Nicole Thomas, and I'm going to take you for a ride every Sunday night on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to set up your week with some strange tales from across North America, from psychic readings, Sasquatch, UFOs, to the most haunted locations. 
Come join me at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, and let's get weird together. I'd love for you to join me. Spaced Out Sundays at spacedoutradio.com. There's news, and there's the encounter. This is Spaced Out Radio News Director Everett Beamer inviting you to check out The Encounter. Our half-hour news segment every Monday through Friday night is different compared to what you're used to. Our goal is to bring you the weird, strange, and interesting stories the mainstream tends to leave out and stories that will make you scratch your head in disbelief. The Encounter can also be found at spacedoutradio.com and on our Facebook page, SOR The Encounter. Come give us a read. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Heading to Vancouver and looking for some great nightlife? The Moose Vancouver is the place to be. Catch a game on one of the big screens or just come rock out to your favorite 80s and 90s hair bands. Great food starting at $6.95. The Moose Vancouver is open until 2 a.m. nightly. It's easy to find near the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag SpacedOutRadio. Now, back to Dave Scott 
and SOR. Welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being with us. Tomorrow night on the show, we bring in Chris Cogswell and Chris George Zuger for a new feature we call Reality Paranormal, which will happen the second Wednesday of every month. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We welcome back everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network and Deep Talk Radio. And don't forget, you can check out our archives for free. Yes, free. Go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Crackalure. Crackalure is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Now, our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to some Mubblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read up on the encounter online, and so much more. And it's going to be changing up very, very soon. But still going to have some pretty good stuff on it. Spacedoutradio.com. Tonight, we are talking with paranormal encrypted investigator david spinks he's out of west virginia looking at all things strange and weird hour number one we talked about bigfoot and his amazing sighting as a child and what did we thought bigfoot was david welcome back hey glad to be back thanks for having me i want to start off i know we're going with the flatwoods monster this hour but dale brings up a very good point in the SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook, the Veterans Club that we call them around here. And he says, there is something empirically weird going on, and that is an obvious place to start. We could work backwards from what might be the camera's malfunction in this manner. And this is going back to what we were talking about in hour number one, near the end, where it just seems like it's weird that these cameras seem to malfunction every time an alleged Bigfoot or something weird comes around. Do you think that maybe that's what we should do, is take some of these cameras and try and manipulate them to recreate the... the, Sorry, I'm being attacked by mosquitoes in my studio here um do you think we we should be uh working backwards to maybe try and move forwards and find out why all these pictures of sasquatch are blurry sure i mean with technology advances in in uh you know photography and, and the way these new cameras work i'm sure why not get some camera experts in there and see what they can do with it i mean sure it makes obvious sense to try anything and everything to figure out why this is going on. Mm-hmm. It's all about the mystery, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you never know what little piece of the puzzle might lead to the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. So you got to try everything, think outside the box, do whatever you can think of to further, uh, you know, to further investigate and get answers to some of these questions. Well, let's move forward to another question here in regards to the Flatwoods Monster. Take us back, because you actually were born and raised in that area, and this is a stuff of legend. So take us back to the Flatwoods Monster story. What happened there? Well, yeah, back in um, in September, and actually, we'll just go back a little bit farther. In 1952, there was a mass UFO wave all throughout the United States, and particularly the East Coast around D.C. area. People were reported, reported seeing UFOs over the, over the White House of all places. Um, there was sightings all across the eastern, east, eastern part of the United States. And in September of 1952, um, folks saw several different objects, um, fiery objects flying through the area of Flatwoods, West Virginia, uh, all through that whole area. Um, there were actually pilots that were tasked that were on 24 hour alert. There were so many UFO sightings going on. These pilots were tasked to intercept anything that was reported and to, they had orders to shoot them down. Now there was a lot of government cover-ups going on at that time too, with these pilots being on 24 hour alert at all, uh, chasing these objects. And it was just numerous stories uh, of pilots chasing these things. And some pilots were even lost. Uh, You know, was it a dogfight? Who knows? But these things were classified and are still classified to this day. So in September 12, 1952, 
there was a group of kids playing uh, at the local grade school, uh, playing football down there, when they all observed this fiery craft come overhead and um, go down on what is what was known at the time as the Fisher Farm. Um, the report said from numerous eyewitnesses that this thing uh, actually maneuvered in a, in a sense. It didn't. It wasn't like a meteor where it just shot across the sky. It was making calculated movements, you know, uh, and it landed on this property. So long story short, these kids ran up to their house, which was towards the property, um, and the May house, um, and told their mom what they had witnessed. Well, a bunch of them got together and they headed up to the Fisher farm, which was, you know, pro- approximately a quarter mile away from their house up on the hill. So they, they went up there. Um, several of them and a dog, a dog accompanied them. Well, the dog went ahead of them and it was a real, they encountered this real foggy, thick smoke that had a really sulfuric, uh, smell and stench to where it, it really like burned their eyes and and overcame some of them to where they began to cough and, and feel ill and everything. And they approached this, uh, big oak tree and that's when they saw this, 10 to 12 foot creature uh, like hovering underneath one of the limbs of the tree. And of course the dog came running back towards them and kept running and never looked back. And when one of the kids put the flashlight on this thing, they all got a good look at it and they all made a beeline straight for the house. When they got back to the house, several of them were overcome with supposedly overcome uh, by this, really noxious fumes and smoke and everything and became ill and were affected for several days after. Um, this story made uh, worldwide news. There was famous um, authors involved in it. Gray Barker was one of them um, and new and several other ones. Um, now that same night, the uh, local national guard was called in not just the regular Army National Guard, but the Special Forces National Guard was called in. Uh, within a matter of hours, they were scouring the area, and they came in covertly um, on the back side of the Fisher Farm. They were split into two groups because some witnesses reported that a plane had went down on the Elk River, which is a couple of miles away from the Fisher Farm, and then the uh, then captain who was in charge of the Special Forces West Virginia National Guard unit, uh, was on the Fisher Farm. So he basically what he did was separate his men into two units and were scouring the area for this supposedly downed airplane. But what, what's intriguing about that is normally the government wouldn't call in a Special Forces unit, you know, for, for, uh, the call from D.C. would not come into a local National Guard unit. Uh, to to inspect the downed aircraft that would be under the FAA and whatnot. So they knew something was going on. You know, they, in my best of my knowledge, they were most likely tracking these objects and they knew it had went down and they sent in a special forces unit under this captain to uh, investigate it. And his orders were, he said in an interview years later that his orders were to collect uh, any samples that he could and send them, immediately back to D.C. And that's what he did. They found an oily substance. They found engines in the ground uh, where it looked like something had indeed landed. And he sent in his uh, specimens that he collected and never heard anything back, ever. And he made a, a statement in the interview he conducted that he felt, without a shadow of a doubt, there was a cover-up of some sort going on. What kind of sickness were these people having in the area? Because I've heard this story a few times, and even Stanton Friedman has been on this show to talk about the Flatwoods Monster, saying that it is one of the most incredible stories that he has ever investigated in this field over his 60-year career. The sickness, what were people experiencing? They were had uh, itching and burning eyes, uh severe coughing uh, out like to the point where they were succumbed to where they were bedridden. Uh, A couple of the kids were really, really sick, according to some of the reports. And, you know, 
But there was also conflicting reports in that aspect that the kids weren't sick at all, and there was a report that the dog actually died as well, And but there was a conflicting report that the dog never did die. And I, I talked to actually one of the last two remaining survivors, uh, you know, Fred, Fred May and his brother. They're the only two living survivors that they know of, and they said the dog did not die. So, you know, you got a lot of uh, different reports, some conflicting on what actually took place. But um, it is what it is. You know, this this was a crazy story. It was a time of fear, great fear in the United States with all these reported UFO sightings over the White House and everywhere else on the East Coast. And, again, we go back to that, the fear of the unknown. You know, that kind of thing can cause just mass widespread panic, you know, for people to... You know, look at look at the war of the world story that was done and the mass panic it created. So people already had that kind of mindset, you know, to think that there's other intelligent beings coming here to visit us. Uh, we really throw the normal way of life and the normal way of thinking into total disarray, if you think about it, you know, in some aspects. Because people back in those days, I don't think they could handle it as well as folks today could. The creature that people allegedly saw, I mean, this creature looked like something right out of the extraordinary. I mean, it's nothing that we have ever seen before. It is nothing that we have ever seen since. Explain for people, you know, and this is where we say in radio, paint a picture for people on what this creature looked like. Well, uh, as I said, it was it was uh, described as tended to- 10 to 12 feet tall. It was a metallic type suit uh, with a metal skirt looking deal around it. And the witnesses that are living, they, you know, they'll tell you to this day, they never saw what they considered a living organism or, you know, human type entity in at all. It was more of a metallic type deal with glowing red eyes and it was putting off these noxious fumes, but it didn't have feet, and it glided. It was like it was in some type of suit that had hover capabilities, if that makes sense. Um, it had long, spindly arms with uh, three fingers, so to speak. But it, the, the thing looked more metallic in nature, almost like a robotic than a living, breathing creature. Now, if there was some living type of creature inside controlling this thing. No one knows, but that's how they described it. And that's how all the depictions describe it. Mm -hmm. Um, There is also one artist rendering of a lizard type creature um, that was inside of this suit. So I don't know how accurate that is, but you know, um, because there was more than one encounter. If you did not know that, um, it not only happened on this particular night, but the very next night, a couple also had a terrifying encounter with a very similar described in nature creature uh, of the same sort. You want to tell me to tell them about that one, too? Yeah, I mean, if it continues on, I mean, because I, I do have a question before we get to that, though. This creature that seemed to have this metallic robotic type suit. Did they, the people back then think this was a robot or maybe some sort of, you know, apparition or shielding device that a, a biological type creature was maybe sitting behind? They didn't know what it was. I mean, it scared them so bad that they, you know, you know, you got to remember it was that, it was that night and there was all this weird misty smoke, putrid smelling smoke all floating around on the mountain. Uh, there was an oily substance also found where this supposed craft had landed and they, they didn't really get, I, I would say, you know, when one of the kids put the light and the flashlight on this thing, I'm sure it scared him so bad because they, the, the report said he fell backwards when he, when he got a good look at it with the light on it. And then all of them saw it for a split second or two. And then they made a beeline straight out of there back to the house on a dead sprint. And the May, one of the May brothers said that his mom hurdled this eight-foot fence without missing a beat, you know. 
So that's how terrified they were when they got a good look at this thing, and they were within feet of it, you know. So, you know, the descriptions were all pretty much the same. They were interviewed over and over by multiple reporters, multiple authors, and interviewed in various different manners. Like, they interviewed them all together. Uh, first, they separated them, interviewed them, um, and then interviewed them all together again. Their stories never changed, and they all had the same exact description of this thing, and they even drew pictures. And these are all young kids, you know. Some of them were, I think, six to seven years old, the youngest ones and all the way up to uh, a teenager who was in who was actually in the National Guard at the time. So that's pretty compelling there and they were new, and they were interviewed over numerous different days too and their stories never changed and they all described the same creature. So if something would have been made up there would have been missteps in those descriptions and, and the events that unfolded that night. But what I find compelling too is the second night, there was a couple that had traveled from New York to Ohio to visit relatives. The names were George and Edith Snitowski, and they had a young infant son with them. And on their way back to go home from Ohio to New York, they decided to take the scenic route and found themselves traveling through West Virginia. Well, right near Gasaway, where I was born, they were traveling on a two-lane highway in those days because that's all there was. And for no reason at all, their car quit. And he knew, you know, he had had the car checked out before they left on the trip. He had a new battery in it and everything. Well, the car quit, and they began to smell this really, they described the same kind of smoky smell, burning, sulfuric smell. Uh, so he gets out of the, George gets out of the car, you know, pops the hood, checks everything, everything looks in order, but the car will not start and won't do anything. So he get, you know, he checks everything, tries to start it again, nothing. And then he notices a faint glow to the right on the side of the road down over an embankment. So he, he goes over there and he, he described, he only did one interview, uh, public interview about this event. In a, in a now defunct men's magazine. I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but um, I read the article. So he, he, he looks over this embankment and he sees this glowing white purplish orb just hovering there, glowing. And it fascinates him. But at the same time, his wife and himself and the baby are starting to be taken, you know, overcome by these noxious fumes as well, the same as the first group of kids that saw this thing you know, the night before, but he's so intrigued. He has to get closer to figure out what this thing is. So he starts making his way towards it down over the hill into the woods. And as he gets closer, he, he starts experiencing these needle like shocking sensations all over his body. And it, it affects him so much to the point that he kind of stumbles and falls to the ground and he gets back up and he try and he touches this thing. And it just like, he described it as a shocking needle, millions of needles going into your body at once. And he gets startled by this and he starts stumbling, trying to get back to the car. And, you know, he's about to really pass out and he leans up against the tree for a few seconds to try to gain composure. He becomes violently ill, starts throwing up. And his wife is looking at him through the passenger window at the whole time. And then she lets out a blood curdling scream. And he looks behind him, and here comes this creature floating towards him in pursuit of him. Uh, same type of creature, same description as the other boys described the night before. It takes literally takes everything he can muster to stumble back to the car. He's fumbling around trying to open the door handle. He gets in the car, and they grab the wife and him, grab the baby, and they. They basically squat down in the floorboards of this old car, 1950s car. You know how they they were huge. You could fit 10 people in those things. He reaches that up in the glove box, pulls out his, uh, you know, combat knife, and they're all huddled together in the floorboard. Which, you know, after what seems like an eternity, he decides to peek up over the dash and try to get a look to see if this thing is still around. And to his horror, he looks out the front windshield and it's standing directly in front of his car or not, not standing, but hovering in front of his car. And he sees this long spindly arm come down and it's kind of like 
feeling around on the hood of the car, trying to almost like it's inspecting what this car is made of. And then it just simply turns and hovers back the direction towards the direction it came from. <clears throat> so after a few minutes, um, he gains enough courage to get up in the car seat and, and, you know, gets out of the car, looks over the hill. And then they see that him and his wife both see that orb, purplish white orb start to lift off and it goes approximately 2000 feet as he described it. And it starts moving in a pendulum to like direction back and forth, back and forth. And it's picking up speed. And then it just in one single quick burst, it just shoots out of there, leaving a trail of light behind it and it's gone. So after this crazy experience, they're so, you know, they're so distraught. They go to a local hotel because they, they're so, so shaken up, they can't even drive. They go to a diner first for a few minutes and try to gain their composure back, and then they decide to stay down the road in a hotel. When they get up in the next morning, he goes to gas up the car. They, they were so distraught they didn't even notice this that night, but when he goes to gas up the car, there's these burn marks on the paint of the car where that long spindle no arm you know, no had kidding. touched it yeah, and burned the paint off of it. So... Pretty intense uh, encounter, and you know he had been contacted numerous times over the years to do more interviews, and he said he was quoted as saying, "Look, I told that story once; I never want to talk about it again." So, well, can you blame him? Seriously, no. I mean, you no. look at all these stories. I mean, whether it's Travis Walton, whether it's up in Canada with Stefan Mahalik that uh, you know that happened in Manitoba, the Canadian Mint just created a coin in remembrance of that event, you know, it's easy to say you're up close to a UFO. You just don't touch it. Or if you're up next to an alien that wants to attack your car, you just don't get out. Yeah. And that really lends into, you know, you know, these people really did experience something profound and it, and it, and it shook them to their very core and who can blame them for not wanting to talk about it anymore. It's something they want to forget, you know, how do we know that this experience was tied to the Flatwood monster though? Because these two creatures seem so different. Well, the descriptions that he gave were very similar in nature. This thing was in a metallic suit. Um, it, the only difference was it didn't have the headpiece like the other one did, uh, the, the shroud deal behind it. And it only had one arm and it glided in a, in the same fashion as the other one. And the suit was described, the skirt and everything was described almost to a T as what the other witnesses described the night before. You know, and this was an ongoing, this was an ongoing thing that was taking place over multiple days. There was multiple craft scene and multiple witnesses all around the County that saw several different craft and reported a, another one had crashed on a nearby, another nearby mountaintop. And there's theories out there by numerous people saying this was some kind of rescue operation, you know, that took uh, more than a day for these UFOs to come in and rescue their counterparts uh, who, who had crashed, landed it somehow, you know, uh, or were shot down by the U.S. government or whatever the case. But there's a lot of different theories out there on there. You know, I grew up hearing this story from my relatives, my mom's uh, first cousin, my second cousin went to school with these boys, and I would hear them talking about how scared they were to walk home from school because they were scared the Flatwoods monster was going to get them. And it was it was pretty intense here in my own family, you know, growing up, talking about how terrified they were because uh, they went to the same school and everything as these boys did. So, um, you know, being that close to it, I was born in Gasaway, right there where that the second incident happened. And uh, I was able to tell that story uh, in Seth Breedlove's uh, Small Town Monsters, the, the Flatwoods Monster, his late, his, one of his newest films. So that was a real honor for me to be able to share that, you know, being so close to that story myself. A couple questions for you in regards to this, because, you know, when it comes to this secondary story, why do you think that secondary story hasn't got the publicity? I mean, looking at a lot of the comments in the chat rooms, people who have heard the Flatwoods monster story before have never heard the second part. And it's this exact same thing with Roswell. 
where you never hear about the subsequent crash at San Augustine. Nobody ever right. talks San Augustine. They only talk Roswell. And I think it's kind of funny because, like, numerous times we've had people on this show talking about Roswell. They never bring up San Augustine. And the crash happened on the same day, like, a couple hours apart in distance. I mean, so why yeah. why are we so focused on the first story and not telling the full story of what is happening? Because this story that you just shared was phenomenal. Oh, yeah, and that was just the brief, you know, that was the fast version, you know. I mean, I think it's all interrelated, and it's very important to share all aspects of these stories because that's all part of what was going down. And, it, and you know, as an investigator, you need to pay attention to those secondary things and things that were going on around the main story as well because it's all pertinent to what was going down and what was happening you know that, that that kind of stuff that information is pertinent to these to these cases and to these stories and they should be talked about more openly uh, i don't know if it was because you know george and uh edith didn't want to talk anymore about it you know and it didn't receive as much publicity as the initial story and literally man the the flatwoods monster story i mean that was 1952 that was right after roswell where this mass ufo wave that, that took place the, during the whole year of 1952 it was really almost whitewashed and, and swept under the rug and then the whole mothman thing happened soon after that and i think it really overshadowed the whole Flatwoods Monster Society and story because of the Mothman became so big and, and happened over so many numerous years. It's a shame that this story did not get more attention uh, in, in the in ufology and in the UFO realm because it, it's a fascinating story. You had numerous eyewitnesses, numerous people saw these crafts, and it wasn't just one night. It was multiple nights. And then there's even, you know, more to it. There was a, an, uh, another story that would, could be connect, connected to uh, the Flatwoods as well that took place near Parkersburg where folks reported seeing another similar type creature a few days after the second story. So, you know, um, and it's, it's very, very limited information on that. But, you know, there was it was a whole wave and a whole mass deal going on versus just the main story. And, and those type of things need to be paid close attention to, in my opinion. Do you think it's because the first story is so sexy that we just forget about it? Forget about what else happened? Because the minute you you start investigating more, you know, that's where you start going down that rabbit hole, David, and that's where a lot of people start getting scared. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the Snicktowskis, man, they had a, a serious, close, even closer, in my opinion, even more compelling story than the the first uh, sighting by all the kids because it was one on one. It was, you know, basically if this thing came after George and was right there at their car for several minutes, you know, this took place that they were having an encounter with this creature of an unknown origin. And it was very, very compelling to me. And, uh, you know, I like that aspect of the story myself more than the uh, the original. What do you think the allure was to all of that UFO activity prior to and after the crash around the Flatwoods area? Well, you know, it, it was, um, you know, uh, Ed, Ed and Fred May. They were ridiculed by their classmates because some of the school children, you know, it, it goes right back to the fear of the unknown because these school children were petrified when this story came out. The school, the whole community was up in arms about what all these people saw. Some believed them and some didn't because it was fear of the unknown. So in order to calm down their kids, the parents said, well, they didn't, you know, they didn't see nothing. They're just making all that up. And that was all in, in the attempts to calm their children down. And they didn't want to go to school. They didn't want to leave the house. They didn't want to do nothing. My own family members were the same way. And they, they never saw the craft or anything or the monster. But, you know, it spread like wildfire through the community. 
And then, you know, you had the National Guard Special Forces in there, uh, you know, sneaking in and, and doing, you know, intelligence stuff and investigating this whole situation. And people in West Virginia, I'm telling you, Dave, if you're not from here, you really don't understand. It's a tight knit, you know, communities. Communities are small, rural hometown people that they don't make up stuff like this and they wouldn't even say it just to say it. They, you know, if they tell you something, you, you can pretty much take, take it to the bank. They experienced something without a shadow of a doubt that scared the living hell out of them. And there's no reason that they, they have nothing to gain by telling a story about like this. I can see that. And, you know, in a small knit community, you know, people are tight knit. They protect one another still. Yeah, so, absolutely. As far as you know, was there any evidence left behind by this this UFO or this creature that maybe hadn't made it into the public spectacle? Um, as far as I've researched and, and read on, uh, the only thing that was reported by the captain, uh, Lovett or whatever, yeah, I think his name was Lovett, Levitt. Levitt, I'm sorry, excuse me. And uh, he reported that they found a oily substance on the ground. He he collect, collected uh, some of this stuff and sent it straight back to D.C., never to hear anything in return. So um, as far as that goes, that's all that I have ever come across that was found. Now, there's other stories. Um, there are Gray Barker and... Um, Another investigator had, uh, I think his name was Holt Byrne or whatever. He's a newspaper reporter. They went up to a, a, a supposed secondary crash site on this other mountain um, where they actually saw like indentions in the ground where it looked like a craft had skidded across the top of this, this field and left indentions in the ground, you know, and, and scooped up the, the it was dirt underneath where this thing had scooped up the, uh, the grass and whatnot. And there was this weird, uh, plastic type material left laying around, um, that they couldn't really identify, but for whatever reason, they, they never collected any of these samples that we know of or anything like that. And they never went back to the site after interviewing the, uh, property owner. Um, he, he reported seeing a, a craft, you know, crash through the trees and, and slide across the field, uh, nearby his home place. But, um, you know, there were several, you know, there were six reported craft, uh, that night seen by numerous witnesses across the area, uh, flying in almost a formation, but they were widespread apart. So there's a lot more to the, to the, the bigger picture story than has been told over the years. The reason why I ask that is in certain crash sites, whether it's Roswell, Kecksburg, San Augustine, even in Shag Harbor, there has always been people going into those areas to see if they could still find some pieces from the very crude collection that the United States military had done at that time. And I'm just wondering if, you know, you go down two, three, four, five feet into the dirt where this craft was, if you're still going to be able to find some sort of metallic pieces. Do we know of anybody who has done that? Um, on a separate note, there was a reported UFO crash uh, here in West Virginia by a farmer who came across this crashed uh, craft UFO uh type object and you know a rural area nobody for miles around this guy's property and he went into town and told some of his family members and other folks about it and they they shrugged it off as he was crazy so he got frustrated and apparently uh went back and took his tractor and buried the thing in the third so somewhere in west virginia there may be an alien craft buried <laughs> you know uh the, the the details are very sketchy on where this property was. I've actually looked into it, and, and I'm still looking into it trying to find this out. But this was back in the uh, 50s, late 50s, early 60s, uh, I came across this report. 
So I have I've been unable to find the exact location of where this supposedly took place, but he buried this in his trash. He just covered it up because it was near his trash uh, heap. Or because back in the old days here in West Virginia, they didn't have trash collection. Everybody burned their trash. So, uh, you know, that's another story in of itself that uh, I came across that pretty compelling, you know, in nature. This guy goes, tries to tell people what he has, what he saw, and they just shrug it off and laugh at him. So he gets pissed off and he goes and covers it up, you know, with his tractor. No kidding. Man, could, yeah. you, could you imagine finding that spot and digging it up? and finding an oh, yeah. entire UFO there. How hard would that be, my friend, to try and keep quiet so that way the government doesn't come in and steal it? <laughs> yeah, that's one of those Cats 22 situations there. Oh, my you know, goodness, am I gonna, yeah. Am I going to be killed for uncovering this, or am I going to come? You know, am I gonna be come up missing never to be hurt from again, or what? You know, but... Uh, no kidding. I'm still searching for that uh, site as we speak, so... Well, I hope you find it. I really hope you find it. One of the things you stated, it automatically brought to my attention about what happened at Shag Harbor in Nova Scotia, where, you know, you said that there's a lot of belief that once this one craft crashed, that there was a plethora of other craft coming on in, maybe as a rescue mission to get their guy out of there, which would seem normal because that's the way a lot of us do things, whether you're civilian or military. We're always trying to look for the survivor. If something goes down, boats, airplanes, cars, whatever it may be. Now, the same thing, though, seemed to happen at Shag Harbor back in 1967 on October 4th when a huge craft crashed into the harbor there. It was witnessed by people, the RCMP, Canadian military, the United States Navy, and hundreds of witnesses and eyewitnesses to this happening. And the alleged story behind it is divers from the Canadian military actually went underneath to the water to check and see what it was, and they said that there was actually some sort of beings on the outside fixing this craft. And, yep. then, and then a couple days later, it was gone. So I'm just wondering if, you know, it kind of makes you speculate whether or not these ships then are not flying solo, but in tandem. Because once again, if you go back to the Roswell-San Augustine crash, well, that's two crashes right there. So obviously those two crashes or those two craft were flying together as well. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean, that's what intelligent teens would do or would be an attempt to rescue their comrades, you know, in some kind of situation like that. That's what we do, as you said, and I'm sure that's what any other intelligent being would do uh, in the same aspect. I just find that kind of uh, curious that, you know, two different crashes and there is like these rescue missions, yet in something like Kecksburg, there wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, you know, there's different stories out there for each type. But, yeah, I mean, there's numerous reports of that type of thing happening, multiple crashes and, you know, multiple uh, ships or craft doing that type of scenario. But that Shack Harbor one is a really crazy, interesting story because there's so many eyewitnesses. You know, there's normal folk, there's uh, police officers and military personnel reporting the same thing. So, you can't discount that kind of stuff. That's the real deal, you know, in my opinion. Well, what's very interesting is there was a news report today coming out about the uh, Jacques Cousteau family was actually yeah. going to be going back into Shag Harbor to investigate the UFO incident. And oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm looking at this right now, okay, on the report at globalnews.ca. Celine Cousteau and Fabian Cousteau, the grandchildren of Jacques Cousteau, are very interested in this story, and apparently they want to find out what is underwater. And they will be apparently special guests at this year's Shag Harbor UFO conference. And they plan on doing a documentary series on it and will carry out an underwater search as well. I mean, with one of the local with one of the local divers 
that was involved in the investigation of the incident. I mean, so that's getting a, you know, 51 years later, that's getting a little bit uh, real once again for what would be considered Canada's Roswell. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, I, I'm not going to miss that when that comes out because, you know, that's, to me, that puts us one little step closer to maybe getting disclosure somehow, you know, and that's very, uh, when you got that kind of, uh, those kind of folks getting involved with it and getting worldwide attention, I mean, it's, it's great for the field, you know, it really is. I got a question for you. You know, we're now 50, 60 years past this Flatwoods monster event. Has there been anything else in the area or any subsequent type of monster seen in the area because of this? Is the town and the people, even though it's a couple generations past, still on alert about this? Or have people just kind of gone on and done their own merry thing, their own merry way? Well, like I said earlier, Dave, like the, the story was really uh, whitewashed or swept under the rug over all these years. And I find it just, you know, very odd that a story of this magnitude was not kept alive as much as it, you know, should have been in my point of view. Um, they, they, you know, the town tried to actually capitalize on the whole thing a, a few years ago uh, by having a Flatwoods Monster uh, event at, in the town. And it did pretty well the first couple of years because that, that was when, um, I think that's when Stanton was involved with it some and, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, Shino, the author and everything. And, you know, he, he wrote, pretty much spent uh, 15, 20 years uh, researching and conducting interviews on this story and, you know, they tried to, you know, really keep the story alive, but it kind of, for whatever reason, it just floundered. And I, you know, as an investigator and being born in that area, man, I was like, you know, there's got to be more, you know, that we can do to keep this story up and, you know, and running because in my, you know, I'm all, number one, I'm a native West Virginia. Number two, I'm a, a paranormal investigator in West Virginia. And I, for, for, the life of me, I just couldn't figure out why this story is not more talked about and whatever the reason, I don't know, but, you know, and then, uh, you know, Seth came along doing his small town monsters home movies and he revived it and it's, it's thriving again and it's doing, doing really well, uh, and getting some attention again. And that's what it's all about for me, you know, keeping these historic to me, they're historical events, you know, and, I think, I think it's very important to keep these stories alive because we need to keep researching and investigating them because you might uncover one of those pieces again that, you know, lead us to having more answers and possible leading to disclosure. You know, I mean, that's what we have to keep them alive. We have to keep investigating them and researching them. It kind of reminds me of my town that I live in here, David, where we have a UFO incident that happened in 1988. And this year will be the 30th anniversary on September 30th when Miriam Delicato was abducted a mile out of town from a UFO that followed her and her friends for about almost 180 kilometers, so 120 miles. and wow. And... You know, it's it's a little bit ridiculous that there are people in this town who've heard the story. They don't want to talk about it. They don't discuss it. And the majority of new people coming in have never heard about it. Yet here I am saying, you know, we have the potential to put this town on the map for the strange and weird. Why are we not taking advantage of this? But there's a lot of those old school thinking crew who are involved in city council and involved in different groups that really hold back these types of incidents. You know, even putting a plaque up, something as simple as putting a plaque up to recognize that this has put helped put the community on the map. And it seems like that's the same thing that's happening in Flatwoods. Yeah, it, it, it blows my mind, you know, to think why, you know, why would they not even 
acknowledge that these types of things are being reported by their citizens. You know, it's the fear. It goes right back to the fear of the unknown, in my personal opinion. You know, people's beliefs. You know, and I hate to say it because you know, it, it seems that a lot of the ones that are Christian-based, religious faith people, they're the ones that shut this stuff down for whatever reason. Um, I'm not trying to pick on anyone out there. I mean, I'm a Christian. I believe in God and everything else, but it seems like some of these zealots or, you know, these hardcore fanatics don't want to recognize the possibility of there being intelligent, other intelligent life in the universe. They don't want to recognize the fact that there's possibly unknown creatures walking among us. And, you know, because it simply because it doesn't stay in the Bible. And on the flip side of that, I say, yes, it does. The Bible talks about giants. The Bible talks about UFOs. If you look in the book of Ezekiel, you will read about uh, a fiery metallic craft that came out of the ground. You know, I mean, there it's in there, folks. It's in there. All you have to do is do the research. You know, you've got to read. You know, don't believe everything you hear. Read for yourself. Research it for yourself because there's, there's passages in all religious backgrounds that talk about extraterrestrials and ships, the sky people, whatever you want to call it, it's out there for the, you know, you just have to research it. It's there. The information is there. There's numerous religious paintings that are hundreds and hundreds of years old that depict UFOs in the background shooting beams of light out. Uh, the Vamanas, you know, the Indian, the India culture. I mean, there's tons of it. It's all cultural backgrounds, all belief systems. It's there. Just read it. We're going to finish off this hour in about five minutes here where we're going to continue talking monsters, but I got a request from Renee in the next half an hour that we're going to have you on the air to discuss some of your interesting haunting investigations. So we can get a little paranormal after that. If you, if you're okay with that. Well, absolutely, man. Yeah. I appreciate I that. Love it all. I love it, it all. It better be good. Otherwise I got to blame Renee. <laughs> All right. All right. I, I know you'll be good for it, my friend. I'm just teasing. I'm just just teasing. Oh, the kids of today in Flatwoods or even in surrounding areas, do they talk about it? Do they even understand? Is it even a blip on their radar? I know, like we just talked about a lot of the adults and, and even the seniors who are around, who may have been around back then. But what about the kids from today? Is that really a lost piece of history then, or the potential to be a lost piece of history? I would say the younger kids, like high school age, have no clue. They really don't. Um there is one gentleman, uh, his name's Andrew Smith, who I'd say he's in his late 20s, early 30s. He has done a phenomenal job. Uh, he works for the Chamber of Commerce, and he runs the Flatwoods Monster Museum. And he, he himself has kept that story alive. He's kept the museum. You know, he's upgraded that museum. And anything he can find, whether it be newspaper articles, magazine articles, toys, anything to do with the Flatwoods monster, he's, you know, he gets a hold of it and he showcases it in that little museum uh, that is now in Sutton, West Virginia. So if any of you folks ever visit this area of Flatwoods in Sutton, please go to that museum and support it because that keeps that story alive. You know, it keeps it going and for future generations. But, you know, back to your question, you know, the younger kids, I, I haven't seen any of them talk about it, you know, any younger generational kids, simply because, like we talked about, it was swept under the rug for the most part. And only recently in the last year and a half has been really revitalized, you know, and, and brought to the forefront again. And that's sad. And that's sad that something that, that profound that happened in the community just isn't being recognized. And once again, I think about the same thing here. I mean, when people like my ghost tours that I do at the local museum, I often bring up the, I, this, this abduction of Miriam Delicato, that it's the 30th anniversary. And the majority of people who have been here have never heard about it. And when you lose history like that, as obscure and as obtuse as it may be, it's still part of the town's history. 
And it should be, yeah. ex- and I don't want to use the word exploited, but that's the word I'm going to use. You should be able to exploit something like that to your advantage because, let's face it, that type of stuff really brings in tourism revenue. Look at Mothman. Look at, you know, Roswell. These are, and even Shang Harbor. These are places that are making huge tourism dollars yeah. off, a, off a really weird experience. Right. And it, those type of events bring numerous other people that have had experiences together and you know they're great in that aspect not only for you know for people like-minded folks who've had experiences or who are just interested in general uh bringing those folks together but like you said it brings in huge tourism dollars for the local economy and you know why not use it you know you make up your own mind you don't have to believe it really happened but you know go and check it out and and come with an open mind and meet other people that have had experiences, you know, as well. And listen to what they have to say before you make a judgment on anybody. We only got about 90 seconds before we got to go to break here. What was, what would be the one thing you as a researcher would love to bring to the public forward in regards to the Flatwoods monster? Just, you know, just keeping it alive and, um, you know, realizing, you know, letting the general public know, hey, there was multiple people that had these experiences. The military was involved heavily. Uh, you know, you had report, famous authors and reporters like Gray Barker and Ivan T. Sanderson involved in this thing, you know, and it was worldwide news. There's actually video games that were made that had the Flatwoods Monster as a boss in them. Um, it's still big in Japan. They made a whole series of toys. Uh, you know, with depicting this creature. So, you know, keeping this stuff alive is, is part of um, pop culture, you know, is part of Americana and it's part of history uh, in these local areas. And, and it, I think it's important to keep them going. You know, I really do. Give a quick shout out to your website because we only got about, like I said, 30 seconds before we got to go to break. Okay, my website's www.davespinksparanormalinvestigator.com. You can find links to all my stuff, social media, events, upcoming events that I'm going to be a part of, and uh, me and Weatherly's DVD series we have, you know, multiple DVDs available. You can check it all out on there. Awesome. We got you for another 30 minutes here, Dave, on Spaced Out Radio. We're going to step into the paranormal realm, check out some of your investigations, the weird and strange stories that you have been investigating. And then at the bottom of hour number three, it will be Everett Themer and the weird, the wacky news from the encounter and the thought of the day. If you're listening to Spaced Out Radio, I'm your host, Dave Scott. We'll be back with more right after this. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. The first annual Caribou Paracon is happening September 28th to 30th in the 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Brought to you by the Canadian Society of Questers and Spaced Out Radio. Come listen to our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Elizabeth Anglin, Paisley Town, Mike Morin, Eric Cooper, and more. It's a three day supernatural adventure at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Tickets for the weekend are $150 Canadian. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. Spacedoutradio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily 
weekly and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media from commercial spots to banners we have it all check out our competitive pricing today Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you an experiencer? Have you had run-ins with strange creatures you can't explain? ETs, Dogman, Bigfoot, Werewolves? They're enough to scare the daylights out of anyone. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski from Your Four Cop. And on the last Monday of every month, you can listen to me and the host, Dave Scott, talk about the weird and the strange being reported on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to bring my investigations and sources, you bring your experiences, and we'll figure out the rest together. Strange days on Spaced Out Radio. Come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us and bring your questions for us to investigate right here on Space. Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. When it comes to the news, we look for the stories that the mainstream won't cover. Welcome to Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter. This is news director Everett Thiemer. The Encounter is about the weird and strange stories that occur daily, and we scour the world looking to bring them to you. You can hear me with Dave Scott every Monday through Friday in our Encounter news segment. Read us online at spacedoutradio.com, or check us out and give our Facebook page a like at SOR The Encounter. So come give The Encounter a read. From the Mile High State of Colorado, sharing our signal around the world, I invite you to Space Out Sundays. Hi, I'm Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm closing out the week by taking you on a paranormal journey to the world of the weird. Ghosts, aliens, psychic phenomena, I will hit it all in your questions too. So let us highlight the paranormal for you. So come join me for Spaced Out Sundays starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, 
its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, we got Chris Cogswell, Chris George Zuger, and myself coming on in for a brand new feature we have starting the every second Wednesday of the month called Reality Paranormal. We're going to get into the science of all of these mysteries starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We say hello to everyone listening in on the SOR radio network, including Deep Talk Radio. And don't forget, all of our archives are free on our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash spacedoutradio. Do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Crackalure. Crackalure is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, space travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, we got a plethora of features for you and some more coming right shortly down the line. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, shop at our store, read up on the encounter online, and so much more. For the final time tonight, we introduce David Spinks. He is an investigator of the paranormal, cryptids, Everything strange and weird when it comes to the East Coast in West Virginia, especially. Dave, I got to ask you, what the hell is so weird about West Virginia? Why does all the weird stuff happen there? I don't know, man. I mean, it's just one of those, you know, it's the Appalachians, man. It's uh, some of the oldest mountains in the world are right here, and I'm in the dead center of it, you know. And, you know, you've got all these different energies involved with that, Native Americans and all the different uh original settlers that came over from various places in Europe, you know, and they bring that folklore and those tales uh, with them. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, one of those, as Weatherly calls it, areas of high strangeness, you know. Um, we've got it all here. We've got UFOs, we've got cryptids, and we've got a massive buttload of hauntings. And, um, you know, I love it. <laughs> kidding i mean you also got i mean mothman originated there as well and of course we touched a little bit on that you know we've heard a lot of mothman here but we're going to blame renee for this for programming this on the cuff here uh going into the last half an hour she wants to hear some paranormal stories now you've been working pretty closely with david weatherly ross allison and a number of people who are you know involved heavily on the television and documentary side of the paranormal give us some of the goods what you've been working on lately some of the freaky stories oh man well you know i i gotta get this in there you know uh I love the paranormal so much that I actually bought my own haunted location uh, last year uh, known as Willow's Weep. And you want me to tell about that whole situation or you want me to talk more about Let's do the, that. Uh... Let's do that, man. Let's get into it. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, I investigated this house in a little bitty town in Indiana called Cayuga. And I came across this house through a friend of mine who said, hey, I heard about this house. we got to go check it out. Well, that was back in 2014. Um, we come to this little town, little bitty town. I mean, I think it's it's got one flashing light, you know, one of those type of towns. And come to find out, you know, the, the whole place is rich in Native American history. There's Native American burial grounds all around this town. Uh, numerous folks report when they dig their gardens, they find arrowheads and pottery in the whole nine yards. With that aside, I came across his house, and uh, one of my friends had told me, man, this place is phenomenal, you know, let's go check it out. Got there, find out the house is built in the shape of a cross, mind you, okay? For one, that's totally odd. Where have you ever seen a house that's built in the shape of a cross? In every corner of this house, there's windows, as if to funnel in energy, Um to come to find out from the prior owner, uh, she filled me in on a lot of this stuff that it was rumored that the man who built it was a postman, a postman or a postmaster. They're not sure, but he was into some freaky stuff. 
Um, numerous deaths have occurred in this house. The house was built in the late, late 1800s. It was a farm, and it was rumored to have been built on top of another property that burned to the ground with people in it and whatnot. So with that unconfirmed, that's just rumor rule for now. But I investigated this house, got some really crazy stuff the first time going around. Um, interviewed numerous other investigators that had investigated it. Many, many reports of shadow figures, people being scratched, um, the whole plethora. And as I interviewed the, the former owner, she filled me in you know, on some of the stuff. She doesn't. She was looking for a house for her son and doesn't remember how they came into this town because they're from down the border 15 minutes away and in Illinois. And came across this house for a really good price, so she called the, the, the number, and the owner came over and met her at the house. So they go in, and she thought it was strange, but the owner wouldn't go in with her. And she's like, aren't you going to come in? He goes, no, I'll stay outside. And she thought that was strange, but went ahead in anyway. Within being in the house in a few minutes, there was a, a two-by-four uh, standing up in the corner, and it flew across the room and hit her son right in the middle of the forehead, splitting his head open. So as they come up, they, they get out of the house, they decide they like the price, you know, and chalk that up as a freak accident that this two-by-four flew across the room and cracked her son on the head. And he... She's asking the owner, well, what, you know, why wouldn't you come in? He goes, well, I don't like telling people this, but my dad was the last person to live in this house, and that chair that's in the room is where he was found dead. He he shot himself in the head, and his blood is still over on the chair, and the chair is still in the house to this day that I own. That's the first freaky thing. Um, so as Brenda's renovating this house, you know, there's the the – the last people had put in a laminate floor over the original flooring from the 1800s and it was all hooved up from moisture. So they, they're removing this floor and they find this weird book of spells and talking about necromancy and how to conjure spirits and all kinds of stuff buried between the floors. So with, so, so far you've got the original builder building the house in the shape of a cross the following energy. And you find this weird book of spells between the floors and you've got the last guy living there who shot himself in the head and died in the chair. Chair still in the house with his blood on it. So after more research and talking to, to Brenda, the former owner, um, she's telling me numerous stories of, you know, her family being attacked in this place. Uh, her husband was over there working on it and had a heart attack. He was in really good health and everything. He had a heart attack, almost died, but he came out of it. About six, seven months later, he was over there doing something else at the house, and he had a stroke. So she swears the uh, house tried to kill her husband, too. Um, and that's how I came to own this place. Uh, she knew I was, you know, I had already been there twice be or three times before this, and she said, I don't want anyone to have this place but you or my other friend, uh, because I know you guys are the real deal, and this place is too dark for just any Joe Blow to have, and no one can ever live here. You know, so long story short, numerous other things uh, were given to me by the former owner of all the strange deaths in this house. Another former owner was a man, and him and his wife at the time had 23 kids. They both had a couple of kids from prior marriages, and then they had a whole bunch more kids. Long story short, he was found to be having incest with one of the, it was his stepdaughter where they had a kid. And back in those days, it was not looked upon, you know, uh, as that big of a deal, but they slapped him with a $700 fine, which was huge money back in those days. But this guy, talk about karma. This guy was out feeding the hogs one evening, and he didn't come back. So they went looking for him. They found him alive in the hog pen and being eaten by his own hogs while he's still alive. Oh, they no. had chewed off. They have chewed off one of his ears, his entrail, his intestines were hanging out, and part of his foot was eaten off. So they drag him back to the house. He's bleeding out profusely, and they drag him into the house where he soon dies. Uh, so his blood's in the house. you know. So you have his blood, the other guy's blood who shot himself in this house, on, you know, stained in that house forever. Um, 
Now, the guy that shot himself in the head a few years earlier, his wife also died in the house. Um, now, Brenda's husband, who she married later after buying the house, lived next door to this couple for many years, knew them very well. And it wasn't known. It was thought that she, uh, it was known that she overdosed, but they they swear that she committed suicide by overdosing on purpose. Of course, the medical report says she didn't die in the house. She died at the hospital. However, Brenda's husband saw them wheel her out of the house dead. So, you know, most states will not declare you officially dead until a doctor does it. So right there you have three strange deaths in this house. Prior to that, um, way back, another man and woman had lived in the house who were the son the son of the original builder. Well, his wife ended up dying in the house, and later he became a hermit and a recluse, and he lived in the bathroom, this tiny little bathroom in this house where he soon died in the bathtub. They found him dead. So you have five different deaths in the house already. Um, now, a neighbor lady who was older that told Brenda of another strange story in this house that a woman moved in with her older son and she had a little girl. Well, she had been married three different times and two of her husband or th all three of her husbands died of mysterious circumstances. When she moved into the house, she was a widow and she had the small little girl and the older uh, boy child. Well, one day the little girl child just ended up gone and nobody knew what happened to her. She just disappeared. And several years later, the neighbor lady told uh, Brenda that, the son had hung himself in the main uh, foyer of the house as well. So there's two more deaths associated with the house. Now, after I took over it, you know, there's, and there, this is just the tip of the iceberg on this place, Dave. I mean, there's so much uh, that needs to be done here. So Brenda's telling me another story. Soon after she bought the house, she hired a local guy to do maintenance on it. So she wanted him to go under the house and look at the pipes to see if they were, you know, okay or if they needed work. So the guy crawls under the house in the crawl space. It's just a small crawl space. You can barely get through there on your hands and knees. And he's looking for the pipes, and he notices these five mounds of dirt under the house. So he starts pushing the dirt mounds away, and out pops a, a bone out of one of these mounds of dirt. So he picks it up. He's looking at it. And as this is happening, he's, and he's told me this story himself as well, which he doesn't like talking about, but he says he was attacked in a sexual manner by something unseen under the house. Uh, this was going on for several, you know, seconds, and then he gained his composure, crawled as fast as he could out of the house, handed the bone to Brenda and said, I'm never going under that house again. Well, she took the bone to the local doctor, and he identified it as a, a child's arm bone. And he also stated that when he was down there, he found a pit in the center of the house that had granite rocks in a circular a pattern around it and there was ashes in the pit as if it was some type of ceremonial pit under this house so upon more renovations brenda found a false ceiling in the in the house because she was looking there was supposed to be in the original plans a staircase well they couldn't find a staircase and then they found this uh this false ceiling and they tore that out looking for this staircase where they noticed in the center room, of, picture a cross in your mind, okay, you've got the, the three arm, the four arms of the cross. And in the center of that cross, they found these four points on the ceiling that was hidden, pointing to the center of this cross in the center of center room of the house. Well, directly under that is that is that pit, too, in the, in the crawl space. So there's all kind of weird mojo going on in this house, as if it was built to funnel in energy, almost like it's a portal. And I've got numerous uh, video uh, captures from her that she, when she put up security cameras in the house of those child plastic balls, the big ones that you can buy at the store where she placed them in the house and these balls would roll off the couch or roll off the chair, kind of roll around in weird patterns and then all stop in the center, directly over that pit in the center of the cross where those points point on the ceiling almost like it's some kind of weird energy portal so i've got those and i've also got it's got 10 to 12 foot high solid wood doors leading off to each room of the cross into where the ends would be 
And I've got numerous video captures of those doors slamming violently by themselves. And it happened so often that one of the doors actually splintered in the middle and the innards of the door like came apart. So they placed 15 or 20 pound rocks on these doors to keep them from slamming. And I've got some footage of those doors even shutting when no one's in the house with those rocks against them. So there's all kind of poltergeist activity. There's shadow, there's shadow figure reports. There's people being scratched. Another disturbing report was they have a barn metal type building in the back of this house that is cement floor and everything. And Brenda and them used to have little picnics and their family would come over where they had a three-year-old niece there and she was pointing up to the window of the house waving and they're like who are you waving at honey and she said that little girl up in the window and they all look and they said there's what little girl we don't see any little girl and she said she's right there can't you see her and they said no we don't see her well a few seconds later the little niece starts screaming bloody murder and they're like what happened what happened she said the little girl bit me on my face right here and they watched a bite mark form on their little niece's face so that's just the tip of the iceberg on this place. There's all kind of other stories that go along with it, um, mysterious deaths and whatnot, strange happenings. With the reason it's called Willow's Weep is because there's a giant willow tree in the front door. And that same poor maintenance guy, I'll tell you another story on him real quick. He's mowing the grass and everything, and he goes to cut the limbs off of the willow tree because they're touching the ground. Well, he cuts some of the limbs off and continues mowing, and all of a sudden he's thrown violently from the lawn, the riding lawnmower onto his back on the edge of the porch where he fractures his back. So, you know, um, nobody ever tried to cut the willow tree after that. Well, Brenda was telling some friend of hers that stopped by one day about what happened to this guy when he was cutting the willow tree, and they said, oh, I don't believe in that. And there was three of them in the car, so they ripped off a couple of the branches and threw them in the dash and took off down the road. Shortly thereafter, going down the road, the man and his brother got into a violent fight in the car where the car went flipping down the road into a graveyard, hitting a tree. All three were life flighted, and they all three have debilitating injuries to this day. Um, between the, uh, the last guy that died in the house, the one that shot himself, and his wife uh, dying, the guy started dating this other younger girl who was helping take care of him after his wife died, right? So... He, uh, she ended up after a few years leaving him and stuff like that. Well, she came back after she found out he killed himself and she talked to Brenda and she said, you know, I'd like to take a piece of the, the willow tree home with me as a memento, you know, for staying here and everything. She goes, well, I don't recommend that, but you, you know, you're more than welcome to. And this girl was in her young thirties at the time. And this happened back in like 2013, 2012, the girl took a piece of the willow tree home and Three months later, Brenda finds out that the girl died mysteriously with, uh, by unknown circumstances on her death certificate. So this house just has, uh, I mean, it's its a freaking gym. It's a hidden gym, and I'm using it for my own paranormal lab, so to speak. And me and Weatherly are working on a book for it, about it, and all the different events that have taken place there. And, and there's so much more to this thing. It's unbelievable. You know, I mean, it's just some of the craziest, outstanding paranormal reports you've ever heard. And that's, you know, that's how I ended up buying the Willow's Weep House. Why in the hell would you waste your money on that? <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm serious, man. If I was your parents, I'd give you a good shaking right about now, man. <laughs> Well, because it's what I do, Dave, and, and, you know, I think it's important to study these types of phenomena and try to find some of these answers. And, uh, you know, um, that's what I want to do, and I have an, I had an opportunity just come to me, and I took advantage of it. So, you know, we're going to see what happens and what transpires with it. My goodness. Well, you know what? I hope you don't get hurt there, man. Are you, are you going to be putting up tours or anything there, or is this just strictly for right now, your own research? Well, right now, I'll, I let in, um, I'll let in certain people, you know, to go investigate it and whatnot. There's been numerous groups over the several years that have gone in there. Um, it's not a well-known location, but... Um, it's known enough, and um, I actually created its own YouTube channel so folks can go see what other groups have captured there along with myself. 
And I plan to, you know, I'm going to rig the house with 24 seven cameras and trigger objects in it to, you know, see what happens when no one's there and see if we can document anything strange. You know, it's going to have all kinds of different devices in there, uh, balls, trigger objects and whatnot. And it's an ongoing thing, an ongoing investigation for me and Weatherly and, and an SOS, you know, uh, society of supernatural. We're going to try to utilize that as our own paranormal lab, so to speak, to see if we can find any, you know, just see what happens and see, you know, what makes these kind of places tick and why this energy and why these things occur in these type of houses, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal to be able to own a place like this with so many different reports, you know, and strange happenings. So why not, you know? Has there been any type of, you know, I'm going to say satanic ritual or anything along there to bring such evil to that property? Well, we don't know. That's what we're looking into. I, I found it strange, you know, that book. I actually have the book um, that was found in the floorboards that was given to me by the owner. And what's what's really creepy about it is this book was put out in the 80s by the Church of God. Now, we looked up the people that are in this book and stuff, and it boils down to basically a false church that is a cult. And, I mean, no Church of God will put out a book talking about necromancy and, and, and stuff like that. You know, it's just not, it's it's a false type of deal that's, you know, and these, these people are basically what you would call a cult, uh, in my point of view. And, uh, you know, this book was found buried between the, the old floor and the new floor in the corner of the house. So there's definitely been some stuff going on there. There's a, there's a, like I said, there's a ceremonial looking pit under the house. There's been human bone found under the house. And I've, uh, you know, I need to do more research on that. I want to bring in some uh, some GPR, you know, some ground penetrating radar, and see if there if this house was built on top of a graveyard or if there was people buried under this house or what the hell's going on because it's almost like it's a a funnel for paranormal energy or a vortex or a portal or whatever, you know, right in the center of this house. And then, I mean, my God, it's built in the shape of a cross. I've never, I had an insurance friend of mine who's also a paranormal guy. And the guy has literally inspected thousands of houses and structures in his time in 40 years in the insurance business. And he said he's never, ever seen a house built like this, not even anything remotely close to it. So there's definitely something up with the whole thing. No kidding, yeah. my friend. That is just weird. We only got about four minutes left with you. When you go into that investigation, do you ever go in there alone, or or is it just that unsafe where you feel that you always should have some company? No, I wouldn't recommend going in there alone. I wouldn't do it. Um, it's too dark in nature. Um, I've been in there with just me and one other person on numerous occasions now and, and experienced some pretty hair-raising things, uh, you know, the the floor shaking violently to you know i'm i'm 240 pounds i'm not a small guy and the floor has shaken so violently in there when i'm in there it's moved me you know and uh you know numerous disembodied voices shadow figures uh strange balls of light that you know you can see with your with your normal eyes let alone the ir cameras and stuff numerous relevant ghost box responses with names of the people who died in the house and the way they died and all kinds, just, just pertinent, relevant stuff that will blow your mind. I'm telling you, it's, it's pretty insane. At what point do you say enough is enough? I mean, you obviously spent good hard earned money on, on this property. You know, how, how do you try and get out of it? Do you, do you fix it up? Do you put money into it to try and maybe bring it to the times where, you know, the floorboards are safe and the ceiling isn't going to come falling down on you? Or do you just let nature take its course on the paranormal? No, no I'll keep it. I'll keep it to where it's safe. You know, if I got to do some work, I'll do some work, but I will never let anyone live in it. You know, there's just no way because if something would happen now, you know, I would feel horrible. So it, it's, It'll stay with me until I decide if I decide to sell it to another paranormal person or whatever. So, um, you know, it is what it is. Either way, it's scary. What do you got coming up for yourself here in the next little bit? 
Oh, well, coming up not this weekend, but next weekend, July 20th and 22nd, I'll be speaking at the Eastern Panhandle Paracon in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Two-day event with a lot of great people. And then in August 17th through the 19th, I'll be at the Gettysburg Battlefield Bash speaking there. Uh, that's a three-day event held at the Wyndham Hotel in famous Gettysburg. You know, everybody knows about the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, and then um, in September, on uh, September 22nd, I'll be at Hillview Manor at the Hillcon Paranormal Convention speaking there uh, at the manor. You know, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on. Uh, we got the, you know, like I said, like we talked about, I got the new big book book coming out in the next week or so. Um, it's in the final stage of being released, so I'm excited about that. And got several other books in the works coming out in the near future. Busy schedule for you, my friend. Do me a favor. Allow our audience to know how they can get a hold of you. Um, if you go to my website, you can look at the page that says contact me. Um, you can contact me uh, via email or, you know, any of my social media sites, Twitter, Facebook, uh, any, any of the, any of those you can reach me at. There's links to all that stuff on my website. Wonderful. Love David, you. David, I really appreciate you taking the time, my friend. It's always a lot of fun to, to chat with you and we definitely have to do it again. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. I enjoyed it. It was a great time. Anytime, my friend. David Spinks on Spaced Out Radio. You can find him on Twitter, Dave Spinks, SOS. I highly suggest you do. Follow him. His stories are incredible. And, of course, he works with David Weatherly, who's a good friend of this show. We say thank you so much, David, for coming on in. Coming up next, we have Everett Themer and The Encounter. We have entered the encounter tonight with Everett Themer as we take a look around the world at the news of the day. Not the news that your regular news outlets are taking a look at. We look at the weird, the strange, and the WTF. That's what the encounter is all about. Don't forget to give our Facebook page a like for the encounter. It's facebook.com forward slash SOR the encounter. We bring in Everett Themer, news director extraordinaire and a man with an impressive head of hair. Everett, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Always, always good, my friend. Always good. You know, would you ever buy a haunted building that is known or a haunted house just for the sake of your own personal research like David Spinks did? In a heartbeat. Really? Yeah. I don't know if I, I would could. love I would love to live in some sort of haunted historic location. Oh, you know, historical location, I could totally understand. But when, well, you, ha when you buy the house from hell like he did, my goodness, my goodness. I, I guess I guess I don't mean it has to be some sort of historically significant location. I, I guess what I mean is that it has a, a verifiable history of hauntings in the past. I would love that. I'm still up in the air about that. I mean, I love the museum where I work, but at least I get to leave it there. You know, by the way, ever before we get started, I got to blame Renee in the speaker chat room for that last half hour and telling us about this uh, Weeping Willow's house. I mean, she's the one she's like, can you talk a little bit of paranormal with Dave before he comes leaves? Yes, Renee, we could do that. So, Renee, I blame you for that half an hour. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, back that to you, Everett. Really back to you. Give us the news of the day, my friend. Well, a Nigerian traditional healer was shot to death, allowing one of his clients to test a bulletproof charm on him. What? This what? traditional healer, this yeah. traditional healer in Nigeria had made some charms that were supposedly bulletproof and he allowed one of his clients to test it on him and the client shot him and he died. 
So well, no kidding. The, the charm apparently does not work, but the, the person who was attempting to buy the charms, uh, has been arrested on suspicion of murder. I don't even know where to go with that. I mean, I mean, that's, that's a Darwin award right there. Well, you know, these traditional healers and these charms of various types, various, I guess you would call them spells are very popular in Nigeria and in their, in their customs. And it's not an unheard of event. There have been several of these over the past probably decade where these healers have allowed their clients to test the the charm and um well it failed wow i mean talk about gullibility or faith one of the two but i, I don't know but you know i i bought mine on ebay so i'm not worried about it because i have a money back guarantee you know, I mean, it, it reminds me of these stories that we hear where, you know, the preachers are so enamored with the power of God. And trust me, I'm not, I'm not, you know, God, don't strike me down now as I say this. But, you know, when they go into rivers infested with like piranha or crocodiles and they get eaten. Or there was a yeah. guy or there was another guy in Africa recently who walked up to a lion you know, and said his faith would would carry him through. Man, he must have been full of sin. But nonetheless, nonetheless, like, when are people going to learn, right? Well, what are you doing that you feel that you have to have the faith in something that will keep you from being shot? I don't know. I mean... On the flip side, that's how the guy who invented the bulletproof vest sold the product was he, he shot himself in the chest. Yeah, but there's a little bit more science and technology uh, behind a bulletproof vest versus some of these charms may be a, a liquid that they drink. It may be some sort of like necklace type bone you know, like a shark tooth thing that some, some people wear, that kind of thing. There's very little science or, or anything behind that other than a few maybe words or, or, you know, prayers said over it. So what kind of amulet or whatever this is, can you describe that for us? Because, you know, we want to make sure our audience isn't buying these because we kind of like them around. I can't describe this particular one, but I did find in my research that it, it it can be a variety of different things. Everything from an elixir that somebody would drink to something like a, a necklace with some bones on it that has been prayered over or that kind of thing. Wow. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You got to think, you know, this guy walks up to the pearly gates and there's like St. Peter saying, really, dude? Seriously, like you actually thought that would work? You know, I mean, there has to be a whole section up in heaven or whatever you believe that has like these Darwin people up there, you know, just shaking their heads. I mean, it is that has got to be like America's funniest home videos up there when it comes to these people showing up at the door or at the gates. You had to go there, didn't you? I did. I totally went there. Could you see it? You can see it happening, can't you? sadly i can sadly yeah. i think i may be there one day oh goodness oh goodness if if it involves your peacocks then we definitely know <laughs> all right let's move on to story number two of the day israel is going to make an attempt to be the fourth country to land on the moon and plant a flag they have a a space agency there that's partnered with a Isra an, an Israeli space company called Spaceil, who were part of a Google competition to land something on the moon. Now, the competition ended up being canceled because of missed deadlines and all of that kind of thing. But the space agency is still going to launch their rocket up uh, or launch their their rover so to speak on a spacex rocket and they're going to land on the moon and plant an israeli flag good for them 
Yeah. Good for them. You know? I but just, it, it kind of... Go ahead. It, it just kind of shows that how, you know, when you look at, at countries that have been to the moon, you have the United States, Russia, China. It, it, this is kind of the next step of countries that don't even have a formally advanced space program being able to use privatized space exploration as a way to get to the moon. I get that. And, and you know, should we even be excited about this? I got to, I got to admit, I'm not even excited about this new space race. I really am not, you know, because I do believe we, we or the Americans went to the moon with the Apollo missions. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there who listen to this type of programming who do not believe that. But I mean to say, oh, we put a, a rover or, or a rocket on the moon. Big deal. It's been done. Why are you not moving people up there? Let's get excited about that. I, uh, it just doesn't excite me. It doesn't excite me. If we're going to explore the moon, we've already had people on the moon. Let's get back there. You can't tell me that the technology isn't there 40, 50 years after we've already done it. It's ridiculous. Well, where I see an issue is with these privatized companies, and I'm all for that kind of space exploration. But when you are able to get smaller countries with smaller budgets and, and less space exploration technologies to use these companies to launch things up, in, whether it be into space or on the moon, who regulates or controls what goes up there? How do we know that whatever that payload may be, if let's say it's a country that we find somewhat, uh, you know, well, let's not call them an enemy, but let's say that they're, you know, questionable. How do we control having those countries send weaponized materials up there? And then all of a sudden you have a threat from a small country or a, a, a smaller, poorer country that you never even expected. Weird. I don't, I don't know, man. I really don't know. But I can tell you this. It doesn't, ex it doesn't excite me. I'm not excited about this. Okay, like when they landed the rovers on Mars, that excited me. Because we were going deeper into space. But to to get excited about about putting a another rover on the moon, like, ooh. And we're gonna get more pictures from the moon, like China. Ooh. I don't know. I don't know. Just doesn't sit well with me. You know? Put some humans on there. Put some humans on there. Let's get a base up there. Let's get some real exploration going. No more screwing around instead of wasting billions upon billions. You're know. just not a very excitable guy, are you? Well, usually I am. Usually I, I, you know, I mean, weird stuff happens. I get excited about it, right? You know, either come out publicly with the secret space program or literally, you know, just tell us that we're going to send some humans up. Enough of this BS uh, game playing that, that we've been doing for the last 25 years, 30 years. Maybe, there, maybe there's already humans there. That's what I want to know. If we're already there, let's get there. Let's, let's bring this stuff up instead of putting a rover on there. Come on. If I was a taxpayer of Israel right now, I'd be pissed off. It's more than just a rover. It's their flag. There, there's got to be some national pride in that. Yes, pride at least. But how about have a human plant that flag instead of a robot? We've already been there. You, hell, it, it's very well known that the Apollo rockets had less technology in them than an iPhone. How difficult can it be? The rockets are better. I mean, they're landing by themselves these days. That's I don't true. Know. I don't know. I mean, have we dumbed down space? Or is there a secret that they don't want us to know, i.e. the secret space program? Let's just get it out on the table. All right. Now you got me fired up. Give us the next story. Okay. This one, this one should excite you a little bit. Vancouver has been named among 
Canada's top UFO cities in 2017. Does not surprise me. There, yeah, there was a report released by a Manitoba-based research company that detailed all of the reports. They found that about 8% of the reports across Canada were unexplainable. But where I find it funny is that, okay, Vancouver's among the top cities. The cities included Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Edmonton. You, you don't have any other cities. We've so got it's lots like lots of it's cities not, here. Oh, lots of cities. Uh, no, you know, Balls Falls, Ontario does not count as a city. Look, you got Regina, Saskatoon, Calgary, Winnipeg, Hamilton, North York. Come on. Dildo, Newfoundland. Yeah. Big time. Hey, now, city. I, you know what? I was going to ignore that one. No, I went there. To... I went there. That's that's not a swear word when you're saying a a town in a province in Canada. But you know what I found curious is that it, there was a total of about 1,100 reports in yes. 2017 across Canada. So that's three a day. Yes. Yeah. To me, to me, that seems a little low. Well, you know what? Vancouver is attracting all sorts of aliens. Albeit, yeah, but. Even at three a day, uh, that that's entirely across the whole nation. That seems like a bit low for a number of reports. I'm just, you know what I'm surprised about Vancouver is the people there, for the most part, are very, very snooty. And, like, you can't even walk down a sidewalk and say hello to somebody. You know, it's kind of like, you know, from what I hear, it's like New York that way. Like Manhattan, everybody's just into their own thing. I am surprised that there is actually so much activity there. But I mean, you think about it. If you look at the research and you combine the ocean along with the mountains, and people are always looking up at the mountains because uh, Vancouver is overseen by three ski hills, Gross, Seymour, and Cyprus, it doesn't surprise me. It really doesn't surprise me. You're very close to Vancouver Island. You're about, you know, 25, 30 miles from Vancouver Island. Very easy to see. And if you put all those energies together, if you buy into that, it, it works. I was talking to Charles Lamaru and, and Paul Kingsbury, who will be a guest. They'll both be guests on the show on August 22nd. Okay, Paul Kingsbury, actually, he's really interesting. He is a, a Simon Fraser University professor who actually got a grant, a major, major grant to study paranormal from Bigfoot to ghosts to UFOs. And he's working with Charles Lamaru on the UFOs. And I am excited to hear that interview. Well, he's one of the only, let's face it, he is one of the only professors in North America who has got a major substantial grant to investigate the paranormal. And when I was talking to them a couple weeks ago, they were hot to trot on it. And if you look at the UFO sightings on Vancouver Island, it's amazing too, because for some reason, these craft always seem to come in from the ocean side and head east. Well, you have to fly right over Vancouver. If you head east, so it doesn't surprise me at all. Do you think that with this gentleman getting this grant, this could be the beginning of some form of change where academics take some of this a little bit more seriously? I think if he gets one hell of a thesis and is able to prove or, or say what we need to do to prove this, I think it could open up some major, major doors. However... I really don't know if he'll get that far because it seems like the more you go down the rabbit hole, the more dangerous it gets. I could understand that. Yeah, so this might be a one time and done type thing. I really don't know. And really, that's it. Really don't know. I think we got time for one more here, my friend. I hesitate to bring this one up because it started on kind of a tabloid news site but it's picked up a little bit of steam, so we should probably address it. It's the reports of a UFO crashing outside of the World Cup 
tournament in Kazakhstan. Right. A- apparently, this one, possibly two UFOs crashed, shook houses. There are reports that communications were broken down and, and stopped. There are reports that this thing started basically a prairie on fire and that it took four hours to put this fire out. There are witness reports that there was one, it would be equivalent to about a 10, 10 foot diameter or three meter, uh, like orb globe kind of metallic. Some report it as a metallic object. Some say it's almost cloth like, but there are so many details in this that are sketchy but it's being picked up by some relatively reliable news sources that you almost have to look at it and consider it. And, you know, what are the repercussions of this? Well, the fact that it happens during the World Cup, too, where the entire world is looking at that area, you know, it's amazing. And do we know if the military was rushed into that area? Has there been reports of an, an expanded military presence? There would have been a high military concentration there protecting the teams from any type of terrorist attack, much the same way as it works during the Olympics. Well, there were military deployments to the crash area. I don't know specifically about the the area of the World Cup. Hmm. Very weird. Doesn't you surprise know, but, me during a soccer event that this would happen. Yeah. They probably fell asleep watching it from space. That's how the crash happened. We finally figured it out. They were looking down on Earth saying, what is this? You know? And they fell you asleep. Are so, you are so mean to soccer fans. I should be. Everybody should be. Everybody should be. You know, but I do think that this is a story worth watching to either find out if it was a hoax, a fake, or did something really fall. There are uh, some speculations out there that it could have been a satellite and or some form of rocket launch, but both Russian and Kazakhstan governments have not confirmed anything and, and have said that there were no planned launches. As semi-reliable as this is, it does seem like something happened out there. Who is reporting it? Is it RT or TASS? Uh, I saw it on RT, but I also, it, it kind of seems to have begun on the Mirror. And then it's the Mirror UK, which would be a, a tabloid journalism site similar to like TMZ. Right. Unfortunately, TMZ gets things right now. And it has picked up a little bit of steam. It's on some other sites. Everything is, they're not, it's not being picked up by mainstream, mainstream yet. But we're going to have to, I think, watch this and see what what becomes of it. Well, I, I'm going to stick with space debris. That's what, like maybe a satellite crashing down or something. But, you know, on the flip side, they usually give lots of notice for when things like that are expected to happen. But, I mean, there's so much space junk up there now. Maybe something collided and they didn't even realize it was falling to Earth until the last minute. I mean, you just we never need, know. Uh, but We I mean, need to the, get that. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that you just know, though, that the way the Russians have always done things is, you know, they don't tell you until the last minute when it happens. They've done that for years. So I'm not putting any stock that it is a UFO, but I think it was probably some sort of space debris. Maybe we need to get that space force going a little quicker. No kidding. No kidding. Looking at the time here. Let's get to the thought of the day, shall we? Thought of the day happens every night at this time. Where during the day, we ask a question on our Facebook page and our Twitter page. And then we read your responses on the air to what is actually going on. So today's thought of the day, what monsters do you think truly exist? I got to tell you, Everett, I'm a little disappointed in today's thought of the day. 
I really am. I'm a little disappointed. Really? I am. Because a topic like this, I think people could have a lot of fun with. All right? And they took it very, very seriously. You know, this is why I, I try and drag out some of these questions a little bit. And I went a little bit vague today, and I, I should have known better. But, I mean, some of the people here, I mean... I, I read some of them, and I had a comment, but mine was going to be just too long, so I I, I let it go. All right. We're going to get to the thought of the Dave here, because normally I like people to be creative with these things, not like one-word answer type things. All right? like people to be creative. And unfortunately today, it wasn't very creative, so I do apologize to that. But nonetheless, we will get to the thought of the Dave. So thought of the Dave, once again, what monsters do you think truly exist? You know, get ready for eye rolling. <laughs> Not on this one, though. Robin says, the ones you believe to be true. And I think there is some truth to what Robin is saying, because a lot of people can make up a lot of stuff to come true in their minds. I mean, look at Slender Man. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, that, that mirrors very much what my comment was going to be. Exactly. Russ states, my second grade teacher, two of my exes, and Hillary Clinton. Hmm. Wow. And this is where it starts to get a little bit serious. E. James says, clergy. So now we're taking the shot at religion there. Chuck, I have an open mind to all of them until proven that they don't exist. The ones that I lean more favor favorably towards are Bigfoot, bipedal canines, and whatever's flying around Chicago, the ones with more people seeing them. Let's see. Suzanne, the president, and much of his cabinet. Here we go. Gale fires back. Oh, for Pete's sake. The one who lives under my bed, of course. My toes may not have been under my bed since forever. I leap into my bed every night. Oh, and I believe in them all, except Mothman, Dogman, and monsters of this creek and that street. I guess I only believe in Bigfoot and Nessie, and I'm not so sure about her. What do you believe in, Gail? What do you believe in? Canadian cat? Our prime minister. That's scary. That is scary. John from the Okanagan. I thought he would say, I honestly thought he would say Ogopogo because he's like right on the doorstep there. But he says, nope, Megalodon still exists somewhere deep in the world's oceans. They do say only 5% of the world's deep oceans have been explored. Then we get into all of this. Humans by David. Vivian. Humans. John. Bigfoot. S.O.R. Cat. Wasps. Well, nobody likes wasps. You know, they just, they're like cats. They just attack for no reason. Stacy, humans. Patricia, humans. Jill, my ex husband. I guess Marion, people. Humans, humans, humans. Come on, let's use some imagination here. Cindy, werewolf, commonly known as dogman. In fact, they are real. Jennifer, politician. There's another humans one. Ozzy Rob, humans. Tim. Bigfoot, Dogman, Megalodon, Mermaids, Not Monsters, Demon, Circa, David Politis. Sarah, the only monsters that I've ever m met have been of the, guess what, human variety. Larry, my ex-wife. David, humans. George, the Clintons. Well, that's a scary two-headed monster right there. All about the humans, Everett. All about the humans. Apparently, a lot of humans are monsters. Daryl gets the final word, says trolls. Even gnomes are afraid of them. Uh, either way, either way, we're leaving it right there on the thought of the day. But I got to be more creative tomorrow. It's going to be tough for me, actually. No, it won't. I'm going out in the bush tomorrow. I'm going looking for Bigfoot in about nine hours. I'm bringing some Tim Hortons with me. I'll give you an update tomorrow on the encounter, Everett. Excellent. Everett Themer, let everybody know where they can find the encounter for right now. They can find the en encounter at facebook.com forward slash SOR, the encounter online. Perfect. And we will be moving it to our website very, very soon. 
We want to say a big thank you as well, not only to Everett Themer, who comes in every night to give the encounter online, but also to David Spinks, our guest tonight, talking monsters of the Bigfoot, Flatwoods variety, and his new haunted house. Yay for you, David! I'm not going there anytime soon. That place sounds freaky. Tomorrow night on the show, we bring in Chris Cogswell and Chris George Zuger. Brand new feature here called Reality Paranormal. It will happen the second Wednesday of every month. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern at spacedoutradio.com. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up. For the guitar god himself, special thank you to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Especially a big, monstrous thank you to everyone on Spreaker for a well-deserved, awesome night. You were fantastic. Everybody on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. And to the packed house in the Veterans Club, the SOR Space Travelers on Facebook. Thanks for sharing the show. Thanks for telling your friends and doing your or part to make us bigger and bigger every single night because together my friends we own the night i will talk to you in 21 hours from now mr bumblefoot we need a favor we need you to take us home good night Watch it, man.